flexibility and change. Thank you very much, Professor. It's very, very nice to have you here. And um, I would like to introduce you a little bit and please compliment, feel free to compliment your experience in our law and space law as well. So it's a pleasure to have you here at our legal and business center, Sejin, which is an institution uh, very innovative and uh, uh, a very innovative and an institution of great protagonism, especially designing this post-graduation in air in air law with uh, subjects in space law as well. So Professor Axel Cartier is a lawyer graduate. Please, uh, if please, I will ask you all, all, the, all the, the students who are here inside Zoom to mute your microphone, okay? Thank you very much. So Professor uh, Axel Cartier is a lawyer graduated from Pantheon Sorbonne, Paris One. Uh, is, has a master in public international law by Leiden University and also a master in air and space law from McGill University Institute of Air and Space Law in Montreal. Professor Excel has acquired more than 20 years of experience in aerospace law, as well as in aviation regulation, including bilateral agreements. And it's also special, specialized in quality and compliance within the framework of ICAO, European Commission, and the European Union Aviation Safety Agency. She has been a qualified instructor working with aviation professionals worldwide for 11 years. And please, please, uh, please, student, please, guys, please, could you mute, please, your microphone because you are inside the class and we are transmitting uh, in YouTube. I will ask you to mute your microphone. Professor Lorena, I think that the host of this meeting can also mute uh, some of the microphones uh, that are open. Uh, if you have the chance, uh, uh, I think as a host, I think you can mute. Yeah, that could help as well. I don't think I can do that because. Uh, Actually, I am not the hoster. So oh. I, I ask Sejin, please, if you can mute all the microphones, please. Uh, Mr. Hobledo, please, could you mute? Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Professor, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but we have students inside the, the, the class. So let me just continue with your presentation. We have, we have still interference. Guys, please, could you mute your microphone? Um, Ms. Fantinelle. Could you please mute your microphone? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sejin. Thank you very much. So, Professor Excel, I'm sorry. So, Professor Excel Cartier will uh, be lecturing today about air law and the resilience of air law in an era of change and instability. As I was saying, she has been a qualified instructor working with aviation professionals worldwide for 11 years. And in that capacity has also trained personnel at ANAC and Embraer in Brazil. And also is a member of the editorial board of the Annals of Air and Space Law, Institute of Air and Space Law at McGill University, Montreal, Canada. So thank you very much, Professor. Welcome, I'm sorry for this. Uh, for this intermissions regarding mics on. And uh, you're very welcome here at Sejin, Brazil, Belo Horizonte, and to contribute we are with our academia with air and space law. Thank you very much. And you may please, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I'm going to, to try something. So I say here, Boa noite a todos e muito obrigada pelo convite. Obrigada aos professores do Sejin, Professor Alessandro Lender, Professor Sérgio Luiz Murão e Professor Lorena Bastinato. Isso é maravilhoso para mim e eu agradeço muito. Infelizmente, o meu português não é suficiente para dar a aula magna em uh, direito aeronáutico, então eu vou falar em inglês e eu agradeço o intérprete, o intérprete. Uh, Marina, muito, muito obrigada. Uh, também quero dizer que se vocês tiverem dúvidas, uh, vocês podem, podem perguntar depois da aula. O meu e-mail está no PowerPoint. <laughs> That is what I wanted to do, and I would uh, uh, love Thank to you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Your report is excellent. I believe in the next year you're ready to teach <laughs> any kind of subject here. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. Yes. Great accent. Great accent. Great accent. <laughs> I'm at the airport. Uh, 
Uh, I'll be at the airport very soon. So I hope you see my uh, my slides. Yes, we can. Perfect. And I would like to give just a, a, a brief message to the students who are here. Uh, então, estudantes, obrigada, alunos, alunas que estão aqui presentes na, na nossa sala do Zoom. Gostaria só de reafirmar que eu deixei aí o link com a tradução simultânea no YouTube, onde a gente está tendo o live streaming. Então, se vocês quiserem assistir a aula da professora Axel com a tradução simultânea, é só acessar o link que eu deixei no chat. Ok? Thank you very much. So, Professor Excel, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, so, what I would like first to say is congratulations, you chose the best possible sectors in the world. So, aviation and space, the rest, it's nothing. No, I'm kidding, obviously. But air and space is absolutely wonderful. Um, and I, I've been so lucky because I've been able to work in air and space uh, basically all my career so far so i'm very very grateful for that um so yes my main expertise here i think you understood is, is safety and security that's really what uh, also what aviation is 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 about uh but it's it's something very dear to me and criminal air law as well which is quite specific we'll we'll talk about a little bit about that um but what is wonderful about aviation and space is that there's place for everyone um so it's it's really uh, a highly uh, regulated environment, highly, uh, it's one of the highest uh, regulated in, in the world, really. Um, but what is really wonderful about it as well is that it's multidisciplinary, so you, you get to work with everyone. Um, I don't know your experience, but being a lawyer, it's very nice, but if you work only with lawyers, at the end of the day, uh, well, you know, it's nice to work with non-lawyers and with aviation and space, um, I started right away in aviation safety, I was very lucky, and I started to work with engineers. And if you're a lawyer, I think you know what I mean, is you ask a question and usually you'll find a way to say, well, it depends. So you try to go on the left, on the right, a bit in the middle, and, but that doesn't work in engineering. So they tell you, is it yes or no? And so basically, it's, it's, my luck was I started right away with people who needed a proper answer. And so with that, I think aviation uh, and space uh, are wonderful. And, and I'm sure you'll do uh, beautiful in this, uh, in this area if you're not already involved in, uh, in aviation. Um, we have a very short time. So I, I just want to do my best to address uh, the topic of resilience in, in, uh, in aviation and air law. Um, and so resilience in aviation and in air law, I, I really highly uh, connect it. Um, and the key, because of course, due to the pandemic, yes. And it's the only time, I will mention only twice pandemic because I don't want to hear that word ever again in my life. So I just, when I say crisis, you know what I mean. So this resilience is uh, what aviation is about. Um, and this quote from a book uh, that I have in the PowerPoint uh, later on in the presentation, you have a source if, you, if you're interested and it's uh, by the former director of the legal bureau of ICAO, who's just retired. Uh, Dr. Jifong Wang, who, uh, who is an uh, um, uh, absolutely exquisite uh, uh, lawyer. Um, and he, he said in this, uh, in this book, of his, his PhD on aviation safety, flight is inherently a risky venture carried out in a hostile environment at a great speed. And this is, this is what we have. Um, so of course, safety is, is paramount. There will be nothing ever above safety. Um, and so, if you have taken a course in uh, before 2020, and you know why I say 2020, um, well, if you took a course in safety or in uh, safety culture or in safety management systems, they, they'll tell you and you will learn that uh, to avoid any risks for aviation, you don't fly. Well, we've had that. Uh, and guess what? Aviation is still here. Um, so with the current crisis, we know aviation is beyond, uh, almost beyond resilient. So that, that's absolutely uh, typical to what we have here. So I will just move on to introduce myself a bit further. Um, so uh, it, it's really in a nutshell, uh, I, I was trying to be, because for me it's, it's uh, today, October 20th, so I'm already tomorrow uh, for you. And I just wanted to show you a really, uh, in, in a nutshell, uh, where I, I come from. So I, I did grow up in Brazil. My first language was Portuguese. My Portuguese is not yet back to what it was. 
but uh, I, I definitely, I was an adorable baby, I think you can all agree. But the point is that I just wanted to show a little bit of where we've been, because imagine my luck, right after um, we were in Brazil, my, my parents who were diplomats got a job in Norway. So try to imagine my luck ending up in November in Norway, when November in Brazil is the beginning of summer. So this was a little bit difficult on me, but it's where I started to realize how important aviation was. Uh, so I lived in Paris as well. You see a bit of Paris. I studied at Sorbonne, of course. Uh, and there's a very important city in my life, which is uh, Toulouse uh, in the south of France. Uh, Toulouse is, of course, where Airbus is as well. It's not just in, in, in Toulouse, it's, but it's really large in Toulouse. Um, and I speak about that because of different reasons. A lot of aviation and space goes on in, in Toulouse. But also there's a, a, a rugby, which matters a great deal in this city as well. Uh, and, and rugby is a little bit also what aviation is, but is there's a place for everyone. I don't know if you ever saw a rugby match, but you have uh, tall people, small people, uh, really large people. Uh, so this is what makes uh, the team win, is to be different and to complete ourselves as a team. So this is something very important. And uh, um, I do have a husband somewhere, you see him in the middle, and uh, he's, uh, there's a fire truck behind, and so uh, I think you know the job he has. Um, he authorized me to, to put this picture, but it's the official picture, which I'm never authorized to use, but he said it's for Brazil, so you can do it. Um, and of course, I attend uh, as many concerts as possible of Caetano Veloso, Gilberto Gil, Machu da Vila, etc. Um, anytime they're in Europe, and now they're back, so that's fantastic. So we, we know it's getting better because Caetano Veloso and uh, Gilberto Gil are right now giving concerts in Europe, so we know things are getting better. So that's, that's fantastic. What I wanted to say, if, if you have questions and if you want to, to ask me questions, please do. Uh, but my, my first name can be difficult. Um, so you can use my second name, which is Brazilian and it's Inés. So if you want to do that, uh, uh, by, by all means, absolutely. Um, what I wanted to say as well is that what is important about Toulouse, last thing about the Stade Toulousain, the rugby, the ambassador of the Stade Toulousain is an astronaut and his name is Toba Pesquet who is now the ISS commander. Uh, so the International Space Station commander. So of course, French people are very proud, but beyond that is a remarkable communicator. And uh, I think it'll be very important as well when Brazil will get the ISC 2024, I'm sure Brazil will win uh, and uh, it will be great because last time was in, 20, in 2000 in Rio. So uh, just to, to, to say that, and it's, I think it's, uh, it's quite uh, wonderful. Uh, also for children, because he really does a lot. And I had that luck to have the first astronaut who motivated us to, to study in space. His name was Jean-Luc Chrétien, long time ago, but this generation is lucky to have somebody as well. So we have a beautiful future in, uh, in space. So I'm trying to move on. Uh, sorry, it was a little bit of a glitch. Um, and something else, why aerospace in my life? Well, you can see I have a little bit of interest in, in different uh, aviation related matters and space matters. But if you followed, uh, uh, um, what's it called? Um, Musica Brasileira Popular, Musica Popular Brasileira, you know that there is a Samba do Avion, there's a Samba do Astronauta, and there's also Samba de Orly. So if with that, uh, the music I heard as a child, I didn't go to space, then frankly, I don't know. So this is just to say that Brazil was uh, before anyone else. Jorge Amado, I don't think he cared much about aviation, a part of when he flew a lot to, to Portugal, but it's just my favorite Brazilian offer. That's why he's there. And of course, there's a little Italian house there because I live in Holland and this is the, the reproduction of the house of Rembrandt. So I had to make a little bit of commercial for the city of Leiden where I live. And that is that. Um, a little bit of history of my family. This is in 1972, uh, Brasilia. As you know, uh, Brasilia, well, you know that very well. Obviously, it's a completely new city. Um, and back then, there was this airport, which was created by this remarkable architect as well, Nimeia, of course. But for you to know, this is pictures taken by my, my parents when they went to pick up uh, Mireille Mathieu, who is a, a French singer. Uh, and this is a picture of that, uh, that beautiful vast aircraft that I thought you needed to see. Uh, so I have a lot of these uh, slides, which I will not show you any further, but for you to know, I have a lot. But the real reason, real reason, I, I think Lorena knows that too, why 
I decided to do air law or aviation. First, I wanted to be a pilot, but okay. It's that reason, and then I'll tell you right now. And it's because of that jingle. And it was a Christmas song, it was holidays, it was beautiful, and it was the most extraordinary airline I've ever been able to fly. So I will not sing it to you, but to this day, I promise you, I know it by heart. So this is really something that, uh, if you know the generation, that's okay, but you have to learn that song. It's a very, very important part of aviation worldwide. Um, you got a bit of a, also to say a little bit why I'm here. Uh, it's, it's whatever is interesting for you in there, please let me know uh, for, for later if you have an interest in any of these uh, entities, but this is something that I've uh, um, basically where I studied and where I, uh, I'm heavily connected to. Uh, and so this is just, just to give you a bit of an idea. Uh, this is where I worked with nice logos and things. Um, and the next slide, you can have a look. And again, if there's anything of interest to you in there, uh, please let me know because of course I'm, I'm happily uh, uh, talking about it uh, now or later uh, regarding all the possibilities we have in aviation. And if I would have an advice is, is to have as much as possible connections that are not necessarily um, um, obvious uh, to some extent. I mean, you, you would focus completely on aviation, that's very nice. And I started uh, then after aviation safety, I moved to aircraft leasing when I qualified uh, to be a lawyer. And of course it's fantastic, but um, you really have to keep up with, with the other areas and, and what's happening also uh, in both air and space. And this is the thing is that you never know, and this is the best advice I ever got when I was at uh, McGill University, they told us that you never know what will feed you. It could be space one day, it could be aviation the other. And right now, well, you can imagine when you're in aviation in March, 2020, you're thinking, okay, that's, uh, I had neighbors coming to me and say, oh, what are you gonna do now? I said, well, what do you mean? I mean, uh, we, we, we're flying masks, we're flying uh, medical supplies, we're gonna fly vaccines. Um, what do you think that the aviation is, you will never fly again. It's like, oh, I'm so sorry for you. And maybe you could do something else. And it was, it was quite extraordinary to, to, to have this kind of encounters um, in, in, uh, in our lives. But all that to say that uh, space is, is doing extremely well at the moment. Um, and of course it's, it's wonderful, but you have to be ready for the moment that uh, it will stagnate a bit. So don't choose between air and space law, uh, or just do both and also look at the technique. So that's, that's, uh, that's important uh, as well. I was involved, for example, here at see Mood Courts. That's a great way to keep up with uh, what's going on because you also meet the, t the talents of, of uh, not tomorrow, today. Uh, so that's, that's uh, in other words, you, uh, and also the, the next generation. And the, uh, uh, I wanted just to show a little bit of resilience. It's, I'm not trying to, to delay the topic, but resilience, is uh, also we started because you really have to see where it started before we can realize where we are today. And so I'm not making commercial for France, it's not what I'm doing, uh, but it's because it was there. I can't, I cannot, oops, oh dear, no, went too fast, sorry. Okay, so here we are. Oh, you mean? Yes. So the Aeropostal, uh, you all know it, of course, why? Because he went to Brazil. It's, it's uh, the only natural thing to do in the world is you in France, you wanna to go to Brazil, this is what we do. So this was incredible if you look at it. And again, if you go in Toulouse, I, I really advise you to go because there's a museum about these uh, pioneers. And if you see the runway that these aircraft took up from, you will have no pilot today that would even want to walk on it. It's, it's absolutely, incredible what these men have done. And I say men because they were only men. There were no women there. Um, I mean, there were women pilots, but they were not in the Aeropostale. Um, but the point is, uh, of course, you know, at least one of them, and that's Saint-Exupéry. Uh, so the father of Leo Prince and other wonderful books about aviation. But this is really, he started with a crazy person who was this La Pécoère, um, and he really launched uh, the whole idea of, of uh, basically having mail sent uh, by aircraft that were flying really close to the sea. I mean, it's, it's just that there was no way uh, to be, you know, you didn't have satellites, you have no idea. So you were flying literally above the sea, otherwise you would lose your way. So this, imagine what it, what it is. Uh, I mean, I can't, I mean, it's, it's just, you can only think, I mean, they were insane. I mean, you have to be a bit insane for that and all that for mail. Um, so it's, it's, it's madness. 
but it was done. And this is a, here I say the saying in French because there's an official translation in English, which I don't find so good. But the point is, I just wanted to show you that because of course it's a major rapida. Well, it was uh, the case now, but just to, it was really just to show you that. Um, and this is what it ends up being a translation in English, but it's, it's basically this. So uh, it, that's, that's uh, when you think of it, amazing. He was a wealthy man. I mean, I don't think a bank would have uh, uh, lended money. He was an industrial person, but he also manufactured aircraft. So this was something that was, he really knew his thing. And then it was called La Ligne. So in other words, when you said La Ligne, it was this flight to, uh, to, to Brazil, basically, and later to Africa. Um, and so uh, this Compagnie Générale Aéropostale, why is it dear to French people? Because uh, in 1933, it was bought with others and it became Air France. So this is a, a very, and the symbol of Air France, you know, this, this uh, we call it la crevette in French, it's, uh, it's the shrimp. Um, uh, this is the symbol of uh, Aéropostale, which is still uh, on the Air France uh, uh, planes. And this, uh, sorry to be about to lose, but this is the hotel where all the pilots were staying and it's still an hotel today, quite luxurious. But just for you to know, all these pilots were there, they were eating in a canteen at the same time, they were just, and so this is really how it started. And all these names, Guillaume, are really famous, but there were hundreds to, to, to do it. And it was launched in November, 1918. 1918, the war was still going on and it was finishing, yes, but, millions of people dead, entire cities to rebuild. And that man thinks this is the best time to launch an airline, let's do this. Um, and he did, uh, but it's, it's surreal when you think of it. And the year after, uh, only uh, six, six months later, KLM uh, was created in 1919. So up to this day, KLM is the oldest airline in the world that still has the same name. So French people are quite upset about it because for us, Aéropostale was first, but the name Air France came later. So this is, this is a feud we have a bit, but all that to say, we owe these people absolutely everything. Um, Blériot, again, a French man, I'm not saying that because he was French, but because he crossed the channel. And the channel is this tiny part, which for Brazil purposes, it's very small, but for us, it was a big thing. And you crossed to go to England. Um, and so he said, that, which is also about resilience. He basically says that it's not the resistance the physical resistance of the air that will stop us. And he calls it the artificial bird, which I find a beautiful way uh, to talk about uh, planes. But then he says, what is really the limit is in our head. So it's, it's really, uh, I find it a really interesting way to put it forward. It actually was in the beginning of my, my PhD. So, uh, because I found it was so fantastic uh, because it really is up to this day, how it is. And it's all related to, uh, sorry, human factors and, and all these aspects. But of course, as we all know, the real father of aviation is Santos Dumont. And of course, I say it in a French way, because for French people, he is French. And for Brazilians, he's Brazilian. So, you know, he was both, but okay. Um, and this is just uh, pictures that I found fantastic. Look at him uh, in his Demoiselle. It's the name of a plane. It's uh, and. It's with uh, uh, tires of bicycle. Uh, so I don't know if you would land into that thing. I, I love aviation, but I don't think I would want that. Um, so it's, it's absolutely amazing what that man did. Uh, he also left uh, his name to a collection of watches in France, uh, which is, well, it's my name. I'm not gonna say it otherwise. It's not my family, uh, unfortunately. But the point is that uh, aviation, uh, Cartier was the first watch for a pilot because before pilots had uh, this pocket watch, so we had to get it out to get the time. And so it's not exactly handy when you're piloting and you have to go under. So what uh, uh, Santos Dumont did is that he spoke to Louis Cartier, who was his friend. And Louis Cartier was the son of a famous uh, uh, a watchmaker, but that was it. I mean, he was, he was good, but he wasn't that famous uh, as others. And so right after the show in 1901, where he turned around the Eiffel Tower with his own airship that he built, and he won a, a prize because it was a prize as it is today, you know, a prize for aviation, prize for space, and he won. And um, he had, uh, had a dinner at Maxime's, which is this uh, really luxury restaurant in Paris. 
uh, with Wigertier and he said, you know, can, can you make me a watch because I can't have this pocket watch anymore. And he did, uh, and uh, he did, and this very watch, no one can have a copy. So it's really in the, the inheritance of Cartier, uh, but it's only for, uh, for him. However, a whole collection was built, hence uh, the first um, uh, wrist watch for men, because it was for women only before, and it was, uh, I forgot who, who did, but it was for, for only women, because women had nothing to do but looking at the time to be on time for dates, you know, so men were busy, but um, so basically this is uh, the, the story of the first wristwatch, which was for aviation. So there you go, we have, and of course, 14 bis, which is uh, what everybody knows if you go to Brasilia uh, and the Pantheon, you have this beautiful uh, uh, book of copper pages with all the names of the famous uh, Brazilians and Santos Dumont, of course, is there and it's written, ou pas d'aviation. So there you go. So we know it's him and this picture, I don't know what you, uh, what you think, but for me, it looks like it was taken yesterday. It's absolutely gorgeous. So here we are. Now we have the serious talk, but I just wanted to make sure that you knew that this is absolutely a fun area to be as well. It's not only problems and crisis and people, uh, you know, that you need to save. It's, it's also uh, fun things. So, um, what I wanted to, to start with, and so this is, this is the, the plan here, is that um, there are different topics, of course. Uh, I, will, I hope to cover as much as I can, but the, the one topic, if you take one thing away from air law, one thing, it's state sovereignty above the territory, uh, sorry, state sovereignty above the airspace of a territory of a state. That's number one, that's the one topic that is linking everything. So if you know that, everything else makes sense. If you are in bilateral meetings, uh, and, and, uh, and, I, and I am, it's always about state sovereignty. So states are always gonna do everything they can to keep as much as possible because it's connected to state sovereignty and state sovereignty is connected to public interest, it's connected to safety, it's connected. So it's, it's really in, an immense uh, uh, sea of, uh, of possibilities that are all coming from state sovereignty. And amazingly enough, you would think state will say, I don't want anything, it's my state, keep away. But in fact, they want to have people, uh, they want to share, they want to travel. Of course, there are limitations, there are restrictions, but you do want, because aviation is international by nature, if you only fly within your country, okay, in Brazil you can, because it's a large country, but imagine I live in Holland, where do I go from Amsterdam? Rotterdam, which is half an hour by train, really. So no, you need to have this connection to the world and look at how much we've been missing each other as human beings. This is what it is. Aviation really connects us and that's not gonna stop. And space connects us too, by the way. Uh, otherwise we couldn't have this, uh, this connection right now without space and satellites and signals and all, this, uh, all these things. So um, currently uh, we have uh, a very soon uh, COP26 in Glasgow, so the famous uh, conference of parties when it comes to environment. Um, it's, in, it's in Glasgow, so the, so the United Kingdom. Uh, the IEC in Dubai is, is going on, so again in Brazil will be in three years from now, I'm sure. Then we have also the high level conference on the pandemic at the ICAO. Um, and we just had IATA in Boston that closed with uh, very, very positive aspects on regarding environment and, and aviation. So a lot, a lot is going on, but they all agree on quite a few things, including having a, a more resilient uh, aviation when it comes to uh, decarbonization. And that, uh, take it with you, it's not new. The, the idea of decarbonization is not today, but it's basically now happening because there is no plan B. There's absolutely no way we can go around it. We shouldn't go around it, but there's no plan B. So that's extremely important that uh, we keep that in mind. So um, um, what do I mention COP26? Because COP21 was in Paris and we all heard about it, not because it's French, but because there was this agreement that was signed. And uh, you have two sides, because you know, you're lawyers, some will go one way, the other the other way. So one side will say, this, this agreement does not apply to aviation. I tend to be one of these people because I actually read this text, but others will say, oh, uh, actually it does, aviation is covered. 
So of course you can go around customer international law, you can try to do something, but fair enough. Um, but good news is we do have something for aviation when it comes to environment already, and it is ICAO and it is global. So we have a really, we're very lucky. We're very lucky compared to other sectors. Uh, I, I love maritime, but the International Maritime Organization, they've tried their best to have a system and he just didn't, I mean, it wasn't implemented. And it's extremely sad because uh, aviation really isn't the biggest polluter on the planet. I'm sure you heard that. I've heard that from neighbors who came to me and said, you have the biggest polluter on the planet, which was you know, a bit strange to hear. They said, well, no, it's not. Aviation really isn't. There's something called coal, you know, coal factories, um, people in general, activity. Uh, so are we going to stop to breathe? Are we going to stop to have activities? No. So we have to find a different way. So this is something that I wanted to say. And the perpetual motion, of course, you are scientifics, a lot of you. So you know what it is. It's this motion that is constantly moving, which is fantastic. I don't know if you ever saw it. If, if you see this instrument, it's, it's absolutely wonderful. And it's what aviation is. Um, so this is, this is important to, um, to take. Um, there are quite a few things in here, but basically um, what, what re resilience is, um, is also what we have now today is to redefine the risks, whatever risks, because the risks, again, the meaning of it, of risks right now is not to say, oh, we shouldn't do this, there are risks. This is basically whatever risk that we can take, that we safely can take. This is what it is about. Not the risks that are basically uh, bringing us to uh, something dangerous or threatening or et cetera. We're just talking about risks that are worth taking. And so redefining the risks is what we're doing right now. And I kill for that as a fabulous mandate um, because it is on uh, uh, adaptation and resilience. But again, it's not new. It's, it's always been there, but the thing that we have now is that we actually built on this resi resilience. So you can think about Santos Dumont in his bicycle, basically, that flew, um, and, and it's, it's the same. It's the same approach to, we can do this. I, I'm, I'm not crazy, you know, I'm a pioneer, but I'm not insane. I, I know what I'm doing. So this is a thing that is, that is quite uh, fabulous. And here, what do I speak about the Montgolfière? Again, not because it's French, I can't help it. I'm so sorry, it's, uh, it's there. But the, the, the point is this, is that this was in, in, um, uh, in front of the Royal House that we still had in France, not for many years, but they were still there. And the first passengers were not human. The first passengers, it was um, a, a sheep, a duck and a rooster. Why? I don't know. I really don't know because there's nothing similar, uh, I think. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think we have a lot to share with any of these animals. Um, but they were on, on the ship. They survived perfectly happy. The queen, Marie Antoinette, the queen uh, was so happy about them that she actually gave them a shelter in her zoo because she had the zoo in Versailles. Half of France was starving, but she had the zoo. So, okay. And I don't know what happened to them after the revolution. Let's, uh, I don't know how long uh, ducks live. But what is certain is that the first presents were not, um, were not human. Uh, very soon after, uh, I think it was, it was two, a few days after, uh, the, the uh, few flights were with human beings. So this was something quite extraordinary. But immediately, uh, almost immediately after, uh, what happened was that there was an ordinance, um, it's an administrative document, that basically the bed manufacturing, for bed launching, or any aerostatic machines. This was the number one text that existed, was to say, no, don't do this, keep away. Um, later, it also was the same, up to, uh, and then, uh, during the 19th century, nothing happened, no, no text whatsoever. And then in 1900, when this is where they started to say, hey, maybe we could actually look at it from a perspective that we could do these things. So that's also something that I find important uh, to say. Um, in terms of the scope, I will not talk about airport concessions, which are absolutely beautiful in Brazil. You, you're, I mean, you don't have anything to learn. You know everything there is to know about airport concessions. Uh, why also time perspective, but it's very uh, uh, extremely important topic. Um, and space law, I will not speak about space law as such. It is also uh, uh, my expertise, but this is not uh, what we have tonight. But again, uh, keep your interest in, in, in space. Um, because it's really highly connected to, to what we do. 
Um, so this is really, I think, what I wanted to, to uh, look at. And why was uh, this ordinance forbidding uh, the looms? Was simply because they were worried about third party liability on surface. So basically, when this thing falls, because eventually it will be on the ground again, if it falls on houses, on, on people, then this is where you have trouble. And France, being very committed to civil law, they said, no, no, uh, although uh, the civil code came later, but the approach uh, was still civil law, of course. Uh, the idea was let's let's stay as safe as as far as possible. Um, so this this was something of, of importance. Um, many topics here, but um, the uh, uh, again the uh, absolute idea is that states are sovereign about the uh, of the, sorry uh, on their airspace above their territory. That's absolutely number one, um, and this principle comes from a very long time ago. Um, and it was in the Paris Convention of 1919, which was right after the First World War. And it, all, it is also, it's Article 1 again, of the Chicago Convention of 44. And really, if there's uh, one article you really need to read and, and remember all the time, or uh, keep in the back of your mind, is this article, because you, again, it will explain everything else. Um, and so um, um, this, this very idea um, uh, again, is connected to whatever else you have. And so this, uh, I start with, uh, does airspace end as a, as, a, as a tribute to Lorena, of course, because I know that uh, she has a heart set on, on space law. So um, this is the thing is that there's this beautiful committee uh, um, on the Committee of uh, the uh, Peaceful Use of Outer Space. Uh, this agenda, it's actually not called a boundary by law. We don't say boundary because it's it's too noisy. It's a bad word. We don't want to use that. So we're using delimitation of outer space. It looks a bit nicer. But also, it's been 50 or plus more, 60 years, that this topic is on the agenda. So nations want it. Some nations really don't want it. And as far as I know, only one nation, uh, one state, has basically said the limit is at 100 kilometers. Only one, and that's Australia. Now, Australia is also a continent, as you know, so they probably have reasons for that. The rest of us, uh, I don't know if you've seen Europe, I mean, it very goes quickly to another state. So you don't want to take that chance. Um, but basically, this is a Kármán line. It was this, uh, this German uh, uh, scientific, so it's a Kármán line. And I don't know if you read the press lately, but many of them make the mistake of saying, oh, yeah, all the, all the states agree on this 100 kilometers uh, boundary. No, <laughs> that's not the case. There's no agreement. So, but um, it's not a problem because when you launch, uh, it goes directly into outer space, so you're fine. But also why? Because states are responsible and states are liable and states are accountable. So of course you want to stay in charge. You want to know who is registered in your country. You want to know who launches from your country because you are responsible at the end of the day. So this is also to do with the, the responsibility, um, not only legally, but also the feeling of being responsible because it is your state. So this is also uh, something uh, to take with you. Um, and then you have different terms that are coming from maritime law. So nationality of aircraft and uh, freedoms of the air. Uh, these are maritime law. Why? Because when air law started, what was the law available when it comes to transportation was, of course, maritime. Um, so a lot in common, but not everything. So nationality of, of aircraft, what is very important is that uh, the term is actually inaccurate, although it is the term in the convention. But aircraft don't have a nationality. Aircraft have a registration. And this registration gives them a jurisdictional link with a state. So when you have an aircraft registered PP, it means Brazil, um, it doesn't mean the aircraft, it's the same as if you're in Brazil. Um, so uh, anything happening on, on board that plane, it remains in Brazil. That doesn't work that way. Um, and a nationality of aircraft, remember that, it's, it's really this jurisdictional link you'll have with the state. And, and that's quite important also when it comes to, to criminal air law, but just to take with you, that is very different from shipping because vessels have a nationality of, an air, of, a, of a state. Uh, aircraft don't. They have this registration, so which is really a, an important difference. Then you have uh, freedoms of the air. They're not freedoms. The freedoms is a nice term, but it's not freedoms. 
And it originally comes from the term um, innocent free passage of uh, maritime law. So you can basically just go through the, the, the waters of the state if you just go through. Uh, if you look at the literature, and if some of you want to, to do call for channel case, which is about in every mood court I've ever seen, uh, you will see it's not that free innocent passage, but okay, uh, just to take with you, but this freedom concept comes from air law, but in fact, sorry, uh, maritime law, but in fact, um, what it is, it's traffic rights. So these traffic rights, states will be fighting to the end to uh, basically allow other states to come and then otherwise. So can I go to you? Can you come to me? Can you take cargo? Can you have passengers? Can you take passengers? Um, okay. So basically very important. One of them is called cabotage and cabotage of course is a maritime term. So in other words, within one state, which is not yours. Um, so that's something also that is uh, happening in, in some states, but also very, very hardly fought for. So um, this is something that, that I thought was important um, as well uh, um, to say. Um, and here, I'm sorry, I have uh, also um, interception of aircraft. And this is a topic which, of course, I have to mention because of the Belarus situation. Um, the council has been dealing with the matter since uh, May, uh, so I, we hope it was supposed to be a quicker decision. Uh, I think everybody understands it takes longer, um, but it's, it's something to follow heavily because um, basically we have a, a state that uh, uh, wrongly informed the pilot um, that, well, there was a bomb on board. Uh, we don't know all the facts, I mean, the facts that we know are these ones. The, the rest, there's been a lot of fantasy uh, set out there. But basically, uh, they basically intercepted an aircraft to land in another country, um, endangering everybody on board. And so this is something that, uh, of course, states cannot tolerate to happen. And hence, we, we really need to know what's, what's going to happen next in terms of law. Um, and so this is, this is also something very, very important. Um, why? Because it is connected to uh, security right away. So I just give you this article free bis. It's connected to that and uh, for uh, a tragedy of Carl 007, Korean Airlines. Um, and this is this this ended up in a tragedy. But the point is, we have this article, but basically also brought the IKO to say, what do we need to do? We need to tell states and to agree. Who exactly, uh, how do you, are you intercepted? How do you know you're intercepted? Because in the case of Car 007, they never knew they were intercepted. They derouted over the Soviet Union territory, but they had no idea. Um, so basically, it's, uh, it's important to, to take uh, with you. Last thing on, on sovereignty I wanted to say was uh, the principle of sovereignty uh, of the airspace. It's not just for the parties that have ratified the Convention of Chicago, it's for all the states. So it's not limited. So think of how, how wonderful uh, ICAO is for us, isn't it? Um, so this is really something uh, uh, important. The economic aspects of air law makes them really interesting for lawyers is that economy, if you read the travel preparatoire, I don't say you should, but if you want to, of the Chicago Convention, you will see, and it was a middle of a war, I mean, a middle, towards the end, but I mean, imagine that. Um, but they looked heavily at the economy and they were talking about economy forever. At the end, in the convention, if you read it, economy, where is it? You don't really see it. Economic regulation is hardly in there, if not at all. So why is that? Because as you know, convention, if you don't have full agreement, then you need to have an agreement in the middle somewhere. So basically, you will read in the convention the term aircraft. You will, the term, uh, you will not have airline. It's not in there. Okay? You will have the technical and safety aspects but you will not have economic or commercial aspects. You will have government everywhere, but you will not have private enterprise. So this is something that, uh, does it stop us to work? No, but it just gives us a framework that uh, what, is it, what happens is that the freedoms of the air, so-called, so traffic rights, they're all outside of the convention. So we have them signed the same day, by the way, than the ICAO convention, but they're outside. Um, and, and it's quite interesting because some countries were in it and then something happened and it was Canada. And Canada is not a country you're thinking of when things don't happen. They usually are quite uh, welcoming. But there was this case of British Airways, it was called BOAC at the time, an airline. 
uh, that wanted to come to Montreal a lot, but they didn't want Air Canada to come too much to London, because London Heathrow, I mean, please, it's, it's special, it's, it's ours. And so Air Canada said, fine, you know what we do? We're going to leave that agreement, so you can't come anymore to us. And that was that. Of course, the UK had to sit down at a table and to discuss again. But the thing is, Canada never came back to that agreement. So they have bilateral agreements with every state and it works. I mean, if you go to Montreal, do you even know about it? No, so it's fine. So we work around it and it's perfectly okay. Um, Open Skies agreements were already discussed back then. Uh, a state called the Netherlands were very, was very much in favor and all the states were, no, 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 no. Let's agree on everything before. Let's have a Bermuda type of agreements, which came a bit later. But this kind of agreements, we agree on everything. So how many frequencies, how many, the price, everything. Um, so that wasn't done, but the Netherlands were the first country that had an open skies agreement in 92. So they waited a bit longer, but it came. So another topic, we don't have the time, I think, but it's on uh, civil and state aircraft. So if you want to have a, a look at that, uh, if I don't know if you have thesis to write on this program, but it's a very nice thesis if you can think about uh, that a bit. Uh, I hope I moved on, yes. So safety, of course, you know by now, it's paramount. Um, and the main crisis lesson we can have is that it increases cooperation between stakeholders. And by I mean stakeholders is, of course, actors, but in terms of this term is used a lot uh, also in business ethics. Uh, but the point is, um, we have so many stakeholders and of course, consumers as well. And in Brazil, you know that consumers have an immense power. Um, if you talk to Anak about consumers, I think they, they had really tough years with consumers. Now it's starting to, to cool down a bit. So but I'm, I'm very happy for you because frankly, it was, it's a bit insane, uh, but it wasn't just in Brazil. But all that to say consumers are very important, but everybody else is important. Non-aviation actors are very important. People who don't travel are very important. So this environment is all in one go. Um, so it's what uh, is referred these days now as a network of resilience is, is basically what we have now. So it's a systemic approach and it's, it's extremely important we have it because it means we're ready for the next crisis. And I don't like to say bad things will happen in the future, but sadly, we need to be prepared as well. Um, and so we have something um, that works. So we are a unique sector, uh, we international cooperation, so harmonization, we need harmonization. If we don't have harmonization, there's no safety, there's nothing. So um, SARPs, what I'm talking about here, are standards and recommended practices. Um, you know them, if you work with them, you know them, it's a very specific tool, um, but it's, it's really very important um, because this is a key to, uh, um, it's, it really is a key success story uh, of, of ICAO, uh, and it's called the quasi-legislative power of the ICAO, and it's really unique to the UN family. We're very lucky, again, I say it, because it's, it's quite unique what the ICAO can do in terms of uh, harmonization, so they really can adopt standards and recommended practices in a relatively short time compared to other UN entities. So it's it's really a, a, a very very promising uh, tool as well for later. So it's it's um, we have to be grateful. Um, but the one part I wanted to say, and this is what Brazil is a champion in, and this is a responsive regulation, which is also officially adopted by ANAC. Um, and it's really, we have everything. We have this uh, safety management system. We have uh, uh, risk assessments. We have reporting systems. We have incentives. We have just culture, uh, collective culture. All that is responsive regulation. And this is also where consumers come into uh, a play and can bring in something instead of saying, just pay me. Um, so this is something quite extraordinary uh, that we have. And I wanted to, to bring it forward. Certification is, is uh, of course, it's, it's a key to everything. IASA, uh, uh, after safety, first job is certification. So you, you know it uh, quite well, I'm sure. Um, and uh, initiatives such as the uh, ICAO No Countries Left Behind, which uh, ICAO has many, many of these helps, such as financing, helping training, uh, and very importantly for the standards of the ICAO. But if you can't do it, 
uh, you have this notification of differences. So you basically say, I want to have this standard in my country, but I can't afford it for whatever reason. And then the ICAO or states or both will help you getting there. And this is what this common denominator is, which again, we're very lucky to have. So regarding uh, selected uh, crisis uh, um, uh, uh, lessons, of course, you, you all know it, but we have this ICAO CARTS response of the Council Legation Recovery Task Force that uh, came out already the first edition in May 2020, so very quickly. Um, IASA, uh, as, as you may know, European, the European Aviation Safety Agency, of course, is an agency of the European Union. But when it comes to regulations, regulations in Europe are always European Commission regulations. They could be European Commission and Council, European Commission and Parliament, but they're always European Commission. They're not produced by IASA uh, or by any agency of the EU. And what is fantastic is that the IASA here, actually, we discovered that in Lisbon Treaty, if you, if you, it was there the whole time, is that IASA can adopt safety directives, and they did. And they did, and it's a great lesson of, of uh, what this crisis did in terms of improving our safety, is that the, one of the safety directives was on the operational measures uh, to prevent virus. So um, it was also adopted quickly. On the economic side, uh, European Commission uh, airport slots, you know, the airport slots allocation, so the extension was adopted uh, because they wanted to avoid this ghost flight system where you had to keep on flying to keep your, your allocated slots. So this was a, also quite ex extraordinary, it was done. And then something we didn't even know existed in Europe, I mean, I have to be honest, I didn't know existed, was the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control, which uh, honestly, uh, I'm sure they were working, but I, I, I didn't know them. So ECDC, and they came up with a map of uh, risk level colors. So basically that we all agree on, this is a color, we know the color that it is. And if you work in safety management, you know that there are colors to indicate the level of, uh, of risk. And so they have now five colors, which is uh, green, orange, red, dark red, and then gray. And gray is uh, when you don't have data. So there are countries that we really don't have data, so we be gray. Um, it's still not fully adopted. I've been involved in this project and it's quite interesting. But the thing is, uh, when, when I couldn't travel from France to, to uh, sorry, from Holland, where I live, to uh, France for 11 months, um, the, the, France was, was saying uh, the Netherlands for us is yellow. And then uh, the Netherlands was saying for us, France is orange. So in other words, uh, and he meant the both the same thing. You can't fly there unless you have uh, special excuses. But the same color, it's not the same color, but it's the same meaning in uh, neighboring countries. So this is something that we hope will be adopted soon in a more systematic fashion. But Europe is a complex thing, let's put it that way. But at the end, we usually agree on, on the principle. Um, I won't say anything much about that, but I just wanted to show you how wonderful Chicago Convention is. There was an article on prevention of spread of disease. It's in the convention as well. And at the time was to do with um, cholera, typhus, uh, smallpox, orphan things, yellow fever, plague. Uh, and of course, this is an article based on customary law from maritime. Uh, but it's, it's just for you to see that this was there. Uh, so, so Chicago really has absolutely everything. Um, it's, I think by now, I think it's clear that uh, I'm quite uh, uh, a happy lawyer, let's put it that way. Uh, I see comments in the chat. I'm sorry, I'm just wondering about questions, just to make sure. I have very, very nice uh, messages and I just wanted to make sure there was no question. So uh, thank you. Um, so um, the air law and security uh, uh, part, you all know um, that uh, we, we, we have safety, that's, that's wonderful, but um, there are other events in aviation, but safety alone um, is, is not enough specialized to respond in. Uh, the important thing to remember is that security is a branch of safety, so it falls under safety. However, it is very specialized branch, so it is, uh, to say it in Latin, uh, lex specialis, so in other words, very dedicated to, um, to really security, and that's, that's uh, really a privilege to have this, because not every sector has something as um, um, complete as what we have. Um, 
but of course we we always have to be careful we never have enough so we always want to make sure that we cover as much as possible but basically i think all of us can agree that if you take an aircraft and uh, you hijack an aircraft and then you use it as a weapon and you crash in towers and kill as many people as you as you actually want to kill uh, to terrorize the whole world uh, that we can all agree that even if you're not a lawyer you know that it's something you don't want it's it's something horrid it's something that is absolutely not what aviation is about but of course we know that but unfortunately it happened so it means that we need a law to say it is a crime because if we don't call it a crime if we don't write it in a convention if we don't have this convention entering into force it is not a crime so we need to have this criminalized so criminalization is this word that is essential in our sector um, and it's really something that uh, um, is, is very important, uh, I think you, you know by now, but uh, criminal law, the, the very first case that, let's say, uh, came internationally, was not international, but it came internationally, and it was within the US, Puerto Rico to, to New York, and it was a Cordova case, where you had these two business, uh, in 1948, imagine, so the aircraft were not as comfortable, um, and just to say that these two gentlemen were very, very drunk and they started to fight and one of them started to attack a flight attendant and started to attack the pilot. And uh, you don't have to know a lot about aviation to know that the pilot really needs to be able to be safe and fine in the cockpit, otherwise really you're in trouble. So this uh, uh, was an interesting case, it landed safely. Um, but the point is that because this aircraft people started to, these two people started to fight, the rest of the passengers wanted to see the fight, so they moved to see the fight. And so the aircraft lost balance. Um, and so, because again, this was 1948, different type of aircraft, but still. Um, and so, all story short, the uh, aircraft landed safely, they were arrested. But then New York had a problem because they thought under which law we're we going to sue these people or prosecute them, what are we going to do? So they looked at uh, the idea of saying, we're going to use the Death of the High Seas Act of the US, which is maritime, because there's nothing else. And so the court said, that's very, very nice effort, but no, it's, it's, uh, we're dealing here with something else. It's not um, maritime, it's not law of the sea, it's not maritime law. So no, it doesn't apply. But it started to have a thinking about this because, first of all, unruly passengers, well, we know it's still today and it's still extremely dangerous. Um, and, also, and also we needed to have something eventually. So it actually came quite, not so quickly after, but relatively quickly after. And it's uh, basically, uh, I will talk about, uh, about that very soon, um, but all that to say, but it's, it's something that uh, uh, quickly came quickly enough came on the table of uh, nations to say, well, we need something specific regarding these events. Uh, the time was called an event happening uh, on board an aircraft, because of course an aircraft is very, very sensitive area. Uh, you're in the air. Um, it's, it's, it's not exactly the place where you can control everything. So it's, it's very difficult. So you need to have tools. And of course, the more you can prevent things to happen, the better, because once it's in the aircraft, this is this is already, uh, I wouldn't say too late, but it's something you don't want to have. Um, you don't want to have anyway, ever, but you really, really want to prevent as much as possible. That came out a bit later, the idea of prevention, but still, uh, the, the, the thought was there. So why is it unique approach to criminalizations? Because you're really looking at what we are really missing. What are we missing? And this is the thing is that because we are, I say we, but ICAO is there. Um, ICAO being a UN family member, you can also look at other conventions of the UN. So terrorism, uh, you have uh, bio attacks, uh, you have uh, lots of other conventions. So it's wonderful to have, but sometimes it's not enough. Sometimes you need to have your own convention. So it takes a lot of diplomatic work, but it's all worth it. And Brazil has been very key in all this uh, uh, approach. And just to show you how successful, I'm sorry. Yes. We have eight criminal air law instruments. Um, and the good news is they all enforce. So uh, this is, uh, of course, if your state is not a member, uh, you know, it's, it's not, hasn't ratified, it's not enforced for you. But what it means is it's all enforced and it's, it's quite remarkable. We have reached that level 
uh, of uh, legal security, uh, legal certainty, I'm sorry, to, to arrive to this uh, absolute, well, I wouldn't say perfection, but we have it and it's quite wonderful. So just to explain a, a little bit further, uh, so the, the first one is Tokyo Convention, and there are many aspects that matter a great deal, but the, the, the number one, um, they don't define offenses, so that's, that is a problem. Uh, but the thing is, it has to be implemented into your national law, because otherwise uh, there's nothing you can do. So but that's really important uh, to, to take with you, that's the one thing, which I have never seen in another area, so please let me know if you have it. But you have this one absolutely incredible part of the Tokyo Convention, which says that aircraft commanders have powers. And it's not the term authority, it's power. Now, power is a very big word, very powerful word, exactly, uh, for, for, for lawyers. But it, it means really that the aircraft commander really is uh, that entity on board that has absolutely uh, a lot of possibilities. One of them is, uh, to, of course, to ask the crew uh, to help, and by that the cabin crew, uh, but they can also, he can also uh, ask, uh, he cannot uh, force, but he can ask passengers to help. There's also an immunity uh, that is uh, granted to people who help on board, um, and once the aircraft lands, then the aircraft, the commander can either disembark, so get rid of a passenger, or deliver to the authorities, so it's, it's really not a small thing, and so he has built up on that, um, because he didn't concern uh, uh, terrorism first, because terrorism in the 60s, um, at least in aviation, was uh, was uh, unknown. But then it started heavily, and originally it wasn't um, that violent, let's put it that way, in a sense of, there were people that were requesting political asylum flying from Cuba to the US. So there was some sort of sympathy uh, from, from authorities, because they felt sorry for, for people who were fl flying away from a from a regime that was not exactly pro-human rights. But very quickly, unfortunately, uh, um, well, events took place. And so obviously you had to put a stop to that. Um, so unlawful seizures of aircraft, this came also later and, and there was this uh, massive um, uh, operation at Dawson, Dawson's Field, sorry, in, in Jordan uh, with, uh, with uh, Gaddafi involved in there. So Libya involved in there as well. And so a lot of conventions, I mean, these two conventions came out of there, so 1771. And then uh, sadly airports then became the targets. And so uh, you have this protocol. Um, unfortunately, as you know, uh, we had an aircraft, Lockerbie, um, that uh, uh, basically was um, blew up uh, because there was a, a Libyan bomb on board. Um, and so this so-called MEX convention uh, was adopted. It's, it's the only standalone convention of the, of the of criminal law, I will show you on the next slide. Um, and then uh, came 2004, sorry, 2010, uh, two protocols, and you'll see what they mean for, uh, for us uh, and for all the conventions. But uh, I just want to speak now about the uh, last protocol, 2014, which is about unruly passengers. So it really is dedicated to unruly passengers and will fall under the Tokyo Convention. So this is something that um, I, I talk about them. And this is just to show you how they fit together. Um, so uh, eventually you see that Beijing Convention will replace uh, uh, Montreal and uh, what is 71 Montreal and then the, the violence at international airports protocol. Um, so that's, that's quite uh, promising already. Um, I've seen, uh, let's see here what Brazil ratified. So uh, you, you have three conventions that you haven't ratified yet, but by the way, a lot of countries, including mine either, um, you have about 35 member states that have ratified. So uh, we're far away from the 193 member states. So it's, it's uh, coming, but it's a treaty that is in, in force. Um, the important part to take with the Beijing uh, 2010 uh, um, instruments, it's about new and emerging threats. So cyber attacks, manpad attacks, you know, when you have this um, so, uh, uh, ground air uh, attacks to, to aircraft, they happened, uh, uh, several times to El Al, uh, they, 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 they avoided the tragedy, but uh, th these were, these took place, uh, using aircraft as a weapon. Um, also the idea of being accomplice, of being planning an attack, you, you, you really also part of this convention, it's not just the actual terrorists that you find or that are on board, it's also those who planned it, who financed it, and that's also something that is relatively new in our world in, in aviation. 
uh, suicide bombings, of course, and then uh, this, this horrible things of uh, WMD and, and BCN. So this is really um, uh, quite promising what we have when it comes to, to security. I could talk forever about security, but I will not, not for now. And here we're reaching environments because I wanted to proceed by, by order. So you had safety for, for IK of the mandate is safety, then uh, security, then here we have environment, which now, as you know, uh, is hardly any topic without it. So um, the, the early beginnings, what is important is that it's not new. Environment is something that was part of aviation for a long time. And the very first topic that came was noise, noise pollution, because I don't know if you heard a triple F of the 60s flying, it's, uh, it's not very pleasant, let's put it that way. So um, they wanted to have lighter aircraft, they wanted to have a, a quieter aircraft. But of course, yeah, you need a technology for this, you need to have the investment, you need to have quite a lot of things. Uh, and of course, to have more passengers flying because you need to finance it all at the end of the day. Um, so again, this is not new. Um, but uh, what we have right now is this general realization that again, no plan B, we need to do this now. And it's, it's not a joke, we need to do this now. And now really states, uh, even the states that were the least likely to follow are really now uh, uh, on it as well. So um, what we have right now, some, some airlines uh, have already told um, the pilots to taxi uh, with only one engine. So that's, that's already to consume less and, and to be less polluting. That has been done. Airbus has uh, already issued instructions on how to do it. I mean, other pilots don't know how to do it, but what is the procedure to, to, to be followed? Because it's an official procedure uh, eventually of the, of the airline. And this is already uh, bringing some results apparently. And so this nation 2050 is a famous net zero. And this net zero, uh, you have heard about it for sure. Um, so what is uh, uh, amazing is this Corsia program. And this Corsia program is carbon offsetting, um, which is, has this basket of measures over several years. Um, and it's created a, a global market-based measure. So that's extremely important. But everything you'll see in there, everything of environment and the aviation ecosystem it's all about one thing and it's creating a market. So if you create a market, you can control this market, a control in, in a good sense. I'm not saying control um, as, as command and control. I'm saying uh, uh, control in terms of, you know who are the stakeholders, you know where things are going, you know how it's financed. Um, and so you're creating a market and you adopt, you adopt technology enablers. So it's all in one go and all the stakeholders are in there. And so, of course, you have a country of Embraer who knows better than you um, what the progress in aviation has been. Uh, we, we received our first E2s here uh, at KLM. I'm going to fly the E2 uh, next month. I'm very happy to Toulouse. With, uh, but every time I fly to Toulouse, I'm happy to tell you that I'm always flying e, uh, Embraer 175 or 190, but soon we'll uh, have the E2 190. So it's, uh, it's quite uh, something extraordinary. But Embraer really has made announcements regarding hydrogen. And so we also have in the hydrogen uh, uh, area uh, the possibility of cryogenic fuel tanks. So it's, it's quite fantastic what we have, I think, as possibilities. And then you have these famous EV tolls, uh, which are electric takeoff and landing aircraft. And the, the term aircraft is not in there because I think the acronym will be too long. But they are aircraft. Everybody speaks about aircraft. It used to be we talk about aircraft and then drones or uh, um, uh, unmanned system or something. But now we're talking about EV tolls. Beautiful. And we're talking about uh, uh, them as aircraft. And the very interesting part here, if you, I'm sure you have it in your program, but if any of you wants to have a very interesting uh, project as part of your studies, have a look at this very interesting question that we don't have the answer to yet which is uh, regarding AAM, which is uh, Advanced Air Mobility. And here's the, this uh, project in the States, it's called Joby, and Joby is, there are several, but Joby is, is uh, the most advanced, so we'll see how, where it goes. But this is a thing that all this question comes back and uh, Airbus is asking about it, Boeing is talking about it, and Bayer as well. And is who owns the aircraft, sorry, who owns the airspace above cities? Because if you have EV tolls, it's for short, short distance, it's for uh, right now 15 passengers. Um, what does that mean? You go from a, a top of the, of the building to uh, the middle of the square. Who owns 
the airspace, who authorizes, who is going to tell us what we can do, what we cannot do. And so that's, that's I think, a very interesting topic if you, if you want to know, because we here, you know, we pass, we, we are people, we want to know who flies and why and how, and we have uh, issues of privacy as well. I mean, these people are flying above our head. Uh, this is something also interesting to, to see, but just for you uh, to, to take with you as well. Um, so this use space urban air mobility is, is, is that, is what do we do with this unmanned, or what do we do with the manned, and uh, what do we do with the airspace? Is it, is it a municipality that decides, is it the region? Um, so which ministry? Uh, so this is something uh, very interesting to, to, to because it's, it's happening. It's, it's not an option, I mean, it's not a, a myth, it's a when. So we need these answers now. And this is also where air law is resilient because this is being talked about. So it's really, uh, uh, lobbying is quite heavy, but we're dealing with people who know their business and they're dealing with ministries that know their law. So we have really an equal level. It's not just forcing states to adopt things. So that's really interesting to, to see as well. And of course, SAPs, sustainable aviation fuels. Um, for some people, it's a short-term priority, and this is what the CEO of Airbus says, but others say it will stay. So let's see. Uh, but what is certain is, is for Europe, at least, I don't know if you've heard of single European sky, which hasn't been very successful, let's say, meeting the deadlines. That's to say the least. I'm, I'm trying to be polite, but it's, it's very, very late. Um, but the point is, um, it still is very good as, as a system. It just has to work. It just has to be implemented fully. Um, and, and you have in there also ideas of uh, not being delayed, uh, to, to, to be less cost environment, to be less polluting. Uh, it's, it's actually uh, um, very fit for what we have right now. And so this could be the boost that the European Commission needed and the Parliament needed and the Council needed in Europe to really have this starting. Um, so this is, this is really um, very, very interesting. And if you're interested in that, uh, have a look at uh, um, this project that is a project by Caesar. And Caesar is not as the, the Roman uh, emperor, Caesar, S-E-S-A-R, which is a single European sky. Um, uh, was, actually, I forgot the acronym now, I'm sorry. Uh, but basically it is the techno technological tool of SES. So how to make SES is with this technological tool. And there's a lot of projects within CESAR because SES is stuck in time. Uh, and it's called Albatross and Airbus is also involved. Uh, and, and have a look and it's Albatross of two S's. Uh, and it's really uh, regarding how uh, we, can, we can proceed uh, in that direction. So it, it is very interesting as well. So again, remember, it's creating markets, and this is what makes it uh, so fascinating. Um, the state aid part, which you may know European Union is obsessed with quite a few things, but one of them is competition law. And so normally, if you're an airline and you need help, you can only have help every 10 years. Now, we know the world is upside down right now, so airlines got a lot of help, but KLM got a lot of help uh, in the form of loans. It's not free money. Uh, for the salaries, it's a different story, but for the actual company. Um, and so they got help, but also the government said, fine, but we have environmental goals for you as well. So these have to be in there. Once you pay back and all, this is going to be in it. Lufthansa already paid back, um, uh, I think, 30% of, of their loan from the German government. So uh, airlines are getting uh, uh, owning back their own pride in, in, in being... Uh, uh, not depending, or at least less depending on states. But all that to say that state aid is heavily regulated in Europe. Right now it's between brackets a bit. But why is it interesting? Because state aid is also connected to these technologies now. And so if you talk to any of these partners, uh, and, and I talked to quite a few of them, uh, including one called Pipistrel, it's very, very interesting what they're doing. Um, they all say, states have to help us financially. We can't do this on our own. And so, of course, you will tell me industry always says the government should pay for them. Fair enough. But at the end of the day, it is true. States have to be involved, but also to see where things are going. If you're not involved, you can't criticize a project after. So this is an interesting to see why, because the European Investment Bank, which is quite active, is very discreet, but is very active. And so what they're looking at is financing financial gaps. And so right now we do have a financial gap. So it looks like there's a good chance that, at least in Europe, 
uh, this will be financed by European Investment Bank, at least some of it, because we're dealing with an ecosystem that matters quite a great deal to Europe. So I wouldn't say competition rules are put between brackets, it's not the case, but it's really interesting to see uh, uh, how far it will go and, and when it will stop, because it will stop at some point. Um, the one thing I also want to do, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I realized I forgot to, to speak about EU ETS. So it's uh, um, emission trading schemes, which is a scheme in Europe. It's not just for aviation, but it's also implemented to aviation. So there's a very interesting case, if you have, a, if you have an interest in that, uh, of 2011 of the European Court of Justice. Um, and uh, because the idea is to say whoever flies into the EU falls under that trading scheme. And of course, US airlines said, hello, uh, not interested. Uh, we're not paying for what doesn't belong to us. Thank you very much. And so this is an interesting. At the end of the day, uh, the court said, uh, tough luck. Um, there was so something called stop the clock. So uh, the, the, uh, all the nations that were non-European did have to pay, uh, but we are, you, you, European states, we're participating in this ETS, and it's actually coexisting with Corsia. So we'll see at the end uh, what remains of the UETS and, and if it's needed once Corsia is fully implemented. But just for you to take with you, because it's a system of cap and trade. So you have, um, you have allocations of emissions to airlines. And then if they go above, then they can buy from other airlines on this market. Remember, market. Uh, if, and if you have less, then they can uh, or keep it or sell it to, to other airlines. So this is a really uh, interesting approach. And interestingly, legally speaking, the court basically says it is called ETS. It's not a tax, it's not a Levi, it's not a custom uh, duty, it's just, a, but it is, it's an ETS. So it doesn't help you really understanding what it is legally to some extent, but this brings me to fuel tax. And fuel tax is, uh, if you work in aviation, you know that uh, aviation is heavily, heavily taxed. It's, it's so heavily taxed, it's, it's really, uh, incredible how much taxes there are. And yes, uh, it's, you need money, fair enough, but it's very, very large. So people have this impression that through the Chicago Convention, airlines don't have to pay tax on fuel. It's not true. It really isn't the case. Um, but just to say, inter interestingly enough, in 2019, the Netherlands said, we should actually create a fuel tax, you know? Um, and we, this is very funny because they don't mention it anymore today. So. Uh, just for you to see, and the Netherlands is quite influential in Europe, so this is interesting. Uh, we'll see, and this is also where uh, consumers matter a great deal because it will be even more expensive to fly. So I think uh, we agree that this may not be a great idea. And I want to finish on on uh, biofuel, which of course Brazil is uh, is leader in, and KLM was the first airline to fly biofuel from Brazil, um, and it was this, this uh, quite wonderful flight. Um, and so this is also, has been one of the aspects which we'll see uh, how long it will stay. Um, but what I also wanted to say is that uh, other means of transportation are still there, um, such as airships. We talked about the airship of Santos Dumont. Well, they, they, they're still there and, and they might actually even be even more important than they used to be. So it's interesting. And we have also suborbital aircrafts and supersonic aircraft, which I don't say we should bring back the Concorde. It's a, in terms of pollution, that was really uh, a lot. Um, but just to say that this is also part of what we have right now, because we know that the whole idea, yes, we have, there's a space race right now, mainly between two companies, we, we all know, we've all seen. Uh, we follow that on, on, on TV or elsewhere. Uh, but what is next as well is to have a um, um, suborbital aircraft that are flying point to point. So basically uh, from, and Virgin Galactic is, is planning that. So basically from Sydney uh, to New York in three hours. So this is essentially uh, uh, what is also, uh, so will it be later, will it be now? Uh, frankly, anything can, can happen. Um, regarding, innovation in air law, and this is uh, uh, something extremely uh, important as well, which is how much uh, uh, air, air law and aviation, of course, can do when it comes to, to innovation. And so um, I want to speak about UNIDROIT because UNIDROIT is, is this institution in Rome, which is connected to the UN. But the idea is to say, we need to unify law. So we have civil law one side, common law the other, where can we meet? And so this exists a while already. They've, they've done a wonderful job uh, regarding, for example, um, general agreements on contracts. How do we 
uh, have contracts internationally. So for example, if you in a civil law system, when you accept an offer, uh, that's, it's a different thing than when you accept an offer in the common law system. So the moment you accept the offer is different. So uh, legally, so you can see the consequences. And, and so there's one convention uh, about that, which is a very interesting convention and that some states have used in their relationship. So UNIDROIT is doing a lot of this. And so UNIDROIT came in 2001 with the Cape Town Convention. And the Cape Town Convention has uh, uh, had three protocols, now there's a fourth one, uh, but three protocols, including one on space, space assets. So it's about assets and space assets, which is not uh, in force, not yet. I think it will be soon the way it goes, but aviation is. So the aircraft, so the idea is, uh, is, is actually quite simple, um, which I think all of you know that, uh, well, uh, aircraft fly. So if aircraft flies, if you leased your aircraft and you, you owe debts, uh, you can fly your aircraft. And then in another country, in a jurisdiction where the uh, owner of the aircraft, the creditor will never get his aircraft back. Um, so this is what this convention is, is, is doing, but also to prevent um, basically companies to end up in debts. So it's, it's a very effective convention, which was not only is it not a KO, but it was also drafted by the industry. So drafted by people who really were in the core of the business, not to say states don't know anything, but because they really, really had an interest in having this convention uh, implemented to have a healthier financial environment for aviation. And there's one successive tool just to take with you called IDERA, which is this irrevocable deregistration and export request authorization. In other words, you can get your aircraft back, you can deregister it, re-register it, and then uh, basically take it back and fly it back uh, to, to uh, where you live or where your company is um, in, a, in a very effective fashion instead of having this aircraft that you see in some airports that are rotting away uh, because the bills haven't been paid. So this is extremely interesting uh, to see, but just to show you that right now you have this uh, uh, movement, uh, this, this boom uh, at Unidroit that really wants to have uh, um, aircraft financing more involved into the future of air law um, and aviation in general, but also the space law part. So it'll be interesting. Um, the, the, the other protocol is on, on trains, uh, rolling stocks, and the third is called MAC, and it's with uh, agriculture machines. Um, so very interesting, very important protocols for, for many countries. Um, I do want to talk also about digital certification, which is uh, uh, the use of uh, digital twins, basically. And so remote audits, not when it comes to security, because security audits are always on spot, they're in situ. You can never uh, do it online and upload documents, it will have to be uh, in situ. But the rest, safety, some part of it can be online, so remote audits, uh, and also the increased use of simulation. So this is gonna be very much present, and it already is. Uh, cybersecurity, I don't think I need to introduce the topic, but uh, you know that uh, 5G has been involved in there's a lot of R&D uh, area uh, right now, but it also concerns in, in flight systems, and, and we know little about it as, as uh, um, people. But if you're involved in working at airlines, as, as, as I am, uh, you see that this happens, unfortunately, that a flight in flight system attacks exists. Of course, they're not publicized because of safety reasons. Well, security, I'm sorry, reasons. Um, but this is really something present, unfortunately. Um, artificial intelligence, uh, you heard of the Internet of, in, Internet of Things, IoT, uh, very much present uh, in there. And on both these aspects, cybersecurity and, and uh, AI, uh, the IASA has uh, established a roadmap. So roadmap for European language, this means we have a plan. So there is this plan uh, connected to regulations and also connected to the partners of the EU outside of the EU. So it's, it's a very large, a very interesting approach. And I finish with um, this, this awareness, training and accountability. And I use the word accountability really on purpose because um, the, the, the idea is that you also need to have everyone involved very much aware of what's happening, very much aware of what we can do all together, of what we actually need as a community. Um, and you need to be standing for uh, what you, you have to do. You can't escape from it. You can't hide away uh, from, from your own uh, accountability. And that I find very important to say. 
um, uh, if you work in safety, you also have this connection with business ethics, uh, and you have a concept, you know, in safety management systems and all that of the company culture of all these aspects. And often they are words. I don't see necessarily innovation, but you will not find any company in the world that doesn't have on their website something called core values. And usually there's integrity, there's, there's all these aspects. But if you look in practice, I don't say it's the case of all of them. But because I'm also an auditor, sometimes I'm thinking, I mean, it's, it's, you don't know what you're talking about. I mean, you have procedures manuals that are never open, they're just there. Um, and you ask them and they have them, but they don't know the procedures because they, they, don't, they don't look at them. So it's really to be aware of this and to be more um, responsible, but the word accountable, because when you talk about safety management systems, you have a concept of accountable manager. And this is not a word for nothing. It's extremely important, it has to be there. And so we need to be also credible as actor in aviation, uh, as actors in aviation. So that is also, I think, part of, of that. And of course, this is connected to what we call, well, I think you know it's KSA, which is not knowledge, skills, attitudes that we all have as aviation professionals and we trained for that. And so this, this matters quite a great deal. And I think it's also part of where innovation uh, can help. Um, so this would be <laughs> hopefully the conclusion. I hope I'm, uh, oh, uh, I'm oh, almost, uh, oh, Four minutes to go, and then uh, it's an hour 30, yay. Um, and basically the concept is, is, is this, and uh, l'instant décisif, and I use it again, not to bring French forward, but because it is a concept invented in photography by a remarkable photographer called Henri Cartier-Bresson, nothing to do with me, but I'm just saying because it's really this moment that the photographer sees and takes the picture where you're gonna have absolutely everything. Uh, and it is really this moment of where you, you know what to do and you, you know uh, how to proceed and you know how to share it and everything. So this is my understanding. It's actually how I call, for me, is how I see it. Or, or what airlock can do when it comes to, to, to resilience is really to be there when it's needed, also when it's not needed, always there, but to really be there when it's needed. Um, and this is something that I find uh, very important to, to bring forward. Um, and so this is where, again, Brazil is champion, the responsive regulation. Um, and this, we have it in safety in general. Here in the Netherlands, you have it for a fire brigade. They also adopted the responsive regulation uh, officially. I mean, not that they were not responsive before, but in 2010, there was this official concept of safety regions, so the fire brigade, the ambulance, and the police. And they have adopted this concept also of responsive regulation, which has been extremely successful and we tested it, unfortunately, with the current crisis, but at least we know it, it works um, because there are so many actors, so many stakeholders involved. And so we need to have it, it working. And so responsive regulation, um, stakeholders, of course, consumers, I'll talk about them again because uh, they, they're obviously very important, but they also need to be taught by others. It's, it's not just a one way. Um, so it's, 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 uh, it's uh, what I talked about, this perpetual movement, but it's, it's, really, it's really that as well. But what is also very important with aviation is that we learn from other sectors. So we, we learn from maritime originally, yes, till today, but we also learn from nuclear safety. Uh, when I started my, my job uh, at the uh, uh, ancestor of IASA, uh, Joint Aviation Authorities, my, my job was on uh, the uh, voluntary reporting system, so to create a reporting uh, system in aviation. Um, and so I looked at what the nuclear safety was doing. In, uh, in France. And again, I say France because, well, uh, nuclear is very present, as you know, in France. So there, there were at the time 20, cent uh, 20 nuclear plants. It's, it's a lot. So we have a, a very uh, large plan uh, in there. But I, I looked at it because it's, it's also where you learn from other sectors that are also in very, very uh, uh, safe uh, safety uh, uh, key in there. So this is also something important because there's public interest uh, as well in there. Um, Aviation is also with this responsive yeah, regulation, yeah. responsive regulation that E lá eles tinham um plano grande 
I am hearing you from the Spanish translation. Alessandro, could you please set down your mic? It's, it's, it's nice because uh, it's good translation. <laughs> I can hear it. Did it. I'm sorry, professor. You may continue. Uh, yes. Alessandro, Alessandro, está me ouvindo? Alessandro. Great. No. So um, I, I, I'm almost done, but basically uh, this is uh, what I wanted to say also because on, on responsive regulation, I'm, I'm not obsessed with that, but it matters quite a great deal. And again, ANAC is, is a major actor in there. Um, and it's also as an answer to what we don't like as lawyers and as nobody does is legal uncertainty. And this is something that um, is, is particularly key in our, in our sector, in space as well, uh, in other sectors too, but this, this is quite special with us. So here um, I, I will finish with this, what I, what I call the air load chain. I don't, uh, I don't pretend it's an it's a international value. But I'm just, for me, I see it as uh, aviation actors, uh, non-aviation actors. We all in this network of resilience, uh, we, the in interdependence of aviation and non-aviation is absolutely, uh, absolutely incredible. Um, and, and we have a systemic approach. So this, this really, whereas resilience uh, is, is brought to the fore again. And um, this, this crisis has brought a new paradigm for, uh, for resilience as well, because we, we're building on uh, already a very resilient sector. We don't come out of nowhere. So with that, I, I hope that uh, this will be uh, um, not too much information, but I, I definitely uh, would love to, to talk more, uh, but I, I'm open for questions, absolutely. Uh, I'm, I'm all awake for, for a long time to come because I have a we're not retraining at three o'clock in the morning for me, so I'm, I'm fine. Don't, don't feel guilty because I'm not going to bed anytime soon. So, um, but thank you for your, for your attention and, um, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Professor. It was a great pleasure, honor to uh, watch your spectacular lecture. It was extremely, extremely interesting and uh, contemporary due to the crisis we have been uh, going through in the last two years, almost two years. So thank you very much. Um, I'd like to give the floor to uh, the class of 2021 who is here and also to professors to point out the presence of the professors of uh, our post-graduation and also to point out the presence of um, uh, Professor Alessandro Lender, who is one of the coordinators and also commander uh, pilot in command, uh, Dr. Sergio Mourão, who is here watching your class. So thank you very much, uh, Commander Sergio Mourão. Thank you very much, Alessandro Lender. And there is, um, uh, an exquisite professor which is present here, Professor Eduardo, Dr. Eduardo Teixeira Fara, who has already uh, asked you, Professor, about, uh, uh, has, uh, has a question in chat, and in your opinion, he's asking, the forced landing of a plane by Belarus has already exposed the weakness of international aviation law. Mm -hmm. This is the first question. And then I will open the floor to the students, to the great professionals who are here today to this exquisite class of 2021. Thank you. Um, well, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Deshera, for, for this question. Uh, yes, uh, it's, it's, uh, the first answer would be yes, uh, weakness of international aviation law, uh, certainly. Uh, at the same time, um, I think what is extraordinary about it um, Extraordinary in the sense of not uh, uh, good or bad, but extraordinary in terms of it's, it's such, a, um, such an event. But it really did uh, bring everyone together to say, not, you can't do this. You can't do this in our countries. Don't you dare try to do this in our countries. Um, and it puts this country, Belarus, that has already quite a lot of issues uh, internationally. Um, he also put Belarus in, in a position that, um, well, some say closer to Russia, but, but then again, we don't know what Russia was going to do because, well, Russia does exactly what it wants. I think we, we, we all know that. Um, but I do think on a, for me, what I found was extraordinary is what the, what the pilots did, because we don't know all the details, of course. 
but what the pilots did were to really follow the procedure and, and asking again, they, they got this information, they said, um, uh, you have a bomb on board, where? I mean, it's, it's uh, really, you, where do you get this information from? And so uh, they really did the full, they followed the whole procedure to really, is it sure there's a, there's a bomb? And they were not sure at all. They, they really, there was this feeling already where something was going on, but they had the safety of the passengers uh, to think of. And so they did uh, eventually land because they really had no choice, um, but also because they were following the procedures of interception of aircraft, which is, um, uh, you, we have it in Article 3 BIS, but also in, in documents of ICAO, uh, or really of what it was. And this procedure was followed completely. Um, also by Belarus, when you think of it. I mean, they had these two jets and, and they really they made a sign. I mean, they, they did everything. So what I think from that perspective, uh, I'm, I'm in, really humbled incredibly by the courage of the pilots because they knew something was going on which was not a bomb but at the same time they also there were the rumors already from the ground they were saying oh but there are kgb officers on officers on board that we don't know this is not clear uh, is it true is not true it's, it's not very clear at all so i'm not sure um, we can't say it right now but what is certain is that the ground told them we have people on board um, so in this case, um, I, I think the pilots didn't have a, a, a chance to do anything else. Um, and the fact they stayed on board the aircraft with the passengers as well, kept them safe the entire time. And so the aircraft could, could leave uh, quite quickly as well after landing. Of course, it's a traumatic experience uh, and we don't know what's going to happen to these two passengers that were, that were taken, uh, a Belarus citizen and a um, Russian citizen. Um, but I still think that law is quite strong in a sense of we still talk about it. Uh, we still uh, are uh, on it. And it's not because IKEA doesn't publicize about it, but it's not being dealt with. And one simple reason is that I, I give a training of IKEA, which normally should be reviewed. Some parts of it should be reviewed by the legal bureau. And it hasn't happened because they're really busy with a Belarus issue. So uh, not to say my course is, is not accurate, but just to say that few things that they should look at. They don't have the time because they really are 100% on, on Belarus. Um, so this is a really, for me, a, a strong sign. Of course, it, it makes it uh, a weak, but at the same time, I do think the procedure that really had to be followed was to keep the passengers safe, uh, the ground safe, and this, this was done. I hope it's uh, an okay answer. <laughs> Professor Farah, please, the floor, is, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for your presence. Well, first of all, thank you very much for your ex excellent uh, class. And uh, I hope you understand my English, but I prefer, I, I think French is a very, c'est très bon le français, non? Moi, je m'en veux parler anglais. Well, um, la langue des affaires. Well, uh, let's see what's going on here. Well, the question is, firstly, because as a former airline pilot myself, I was concerned about this because I haven't heard before that uh, an airplane, a civil airplane would be, actually hijacked by the government saying, well, you have to land somewhere. And I've witnessed myself during some encounters and during Vatic Airlines, I was a former airline for Vatic Airlines. So thank you for enjoying my former employee, employer actually. And uh, I was really scared when this happened because, you know, uh, some pilots in different jurisdictions, their families are kind of a hostage for the government if they don't return home, So I'm saying. I'm not gonna point out which country is this because of lack of proof. But what I'm saying is, uh, how can you imagine that an airline pilot with all that power that you already told that there is written, it's written on the, our conventions is not enforceable in this case. So what would go on in the circumstances? Imagine an airplane, airplane is overflying Brazil, for example. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden uh, the Argentinian government says, well, we have to land this plane in Buenos Aires because they have some people that they want to take out their airplane. And this happened in Europe. So yeah. uh, my major concern is, I think the international aviation law has already written for some for a point. And we have to make it stronger in order to maintain the, par uh, the paramount of safety. That's the point. Uh, I agree, absolutely. It's really, I agree. Uh, and, and, and again, the good thing is, I, I think that it, this will end up uh, in, in, in criminal air law for sure. Uh, but what the pilots have uh, already available, because it's not just the training of airlines, but they have on board a list of members of, uh, of the conventions. 
And it's, as you know, pilots, uh, we're asking a lot of them, uh, but also to be lawyers. <laughs> I think uh, <clears throat> it's very clear. They're very busy, but the point is they have this list. Uh, also those who fly in Europe, they know which country is a member of which convention and what it means for them. It is not that they have to read the convention, but what they see is, oh, if I land in Belarus, uh, this has nothing to do, they haven't ratified anything. So they know, they know that. Um, it's, I think knowing already in advance, I don't say it's fantastic, but you have already some degree of preparation of what could happen to you. But what I do think is that these pilots uh, really, um, because let's not forget two events that took place. So CAL 007, that was in, in 1983. Yes, it's a long time ago, but uh, it happened. So this aircraft was shot down by um, Soviet Union. Uh, and if you listen to the cockpit uh, conversations, the pilots were talking about their families. Uh, they had no idea um, that they had derouted. Basically, they were flying over the Soviet uh, Union territory without realizing. Uh, there was no shot, there was no, uh, no warning, nothing. Um, and what came out was, um, uh, if, you, if, you, if you read um, the, and it's, it's very chilling, so you have to be ready for that. But if you read the conversation between the pilots of the military aircraft and the ground. And if you're a pilot, also in space, by the way, you know that the ground is, is normally the one that decides. So this is a terrible thing. Uh, but the pilot, the, the, it was a military aircraft, but then the, the, the ground, it, it, this pilot, he says, it's a civil airliner. And, and he says it, it's, it's clear. Uh, and then the answer is shoot target. And then he says it again, he said, it's a civil airliner. And then the answer remains, shoot target. And what is extraordinary about it is that he asked it twice. And normally in Soviet Union procedure, once was enough. Uh, and actually not at all. So they say shoot target, do it. Um, and so I, I don't say I admire this pilot, but I, I find it still, it's, there was still an attempt of avoiding uh, that happening. And it's because of that we have this interception of aircraft procedures. Are they enough? we'll have to do more uh, for sure. Uh, but the other event that took place is of course MH17, Malaysian aircraft um, airlines and um, with the vast majority of Dutch passengers on board. Uh, and this was, uh, is, well, a trauma in Holland, of course, a trauma in Australia, in Malaysia, uh, Germany as well. Uh, it's, it's, it's not only Dutch citizens, but the point is that um, uh, it made it very, um, Something I didn't realize before is that the Netherlands uh, are usually involved in diplomatic circles, not to say countries are not, but they're very involved in uh, diplomatic exercises that uh, we don't never know about. So perfect diplomacy. And this is a good example is Lockerbie because the Lockerbie aircraft that was blown up that I talked about, the, uh, uh, this, this aircraft in, in 1988, and it's called Lockerbie because it, it uh, crashed on this, the village of Lockerbie in Scotland. Um, well, what happened with that uh, uh, is this realization that uh, uh, well, we obviously didn't have enough, but what, what happened is that eventually a trial took place in, in Holland, but it was under Scottish jurisdiction. So Libya said the only country we trust to organize this trial to be fair is the Netherlands. And so I actually attended that trial and you, you were entering, it's a former base, military base of the, of the, of the Netherlands, and it was Scotland. It was, everybody was Scottish there, even the dogs uh, were there, the, the police dogs were, were Scottish. Everything was Scottish. Uh, so it was basically Scot Scotland moved to the Netherlands for this trial. Um, so this was also something that was not planned in any uh, uh, um, treaties. There was nothing like that. Uh, but now the Netherlands are in a very different position. They're in a position of a victim in a position that it's, it's very difficult to, to, to know, but they have this trial right now. I don't know if, if this is known in, in Brazil, but there's a trial right now um, in, in, in the Netherlands for the, the Malaysian aircraft uh, 17 uh, that took place in 2014. So it's, it's quite extraordinary, but it's not enough. Of course, it's not enough. Um, so I'm, that's why I'm really, really waiting for what the ICAO Council will publish because ICAO has uh, quite a lot of remarkable uh, tools. But as you, you know very well, because for Brazil has uh, uh, one brought before the council uh, with the, the uh, um, legacy, uh, um, the, the Embraer legacy and the uh, Gold airline. 
um, which ended up in a tragedy as well. And this was also brought before the Council of ICAO. Um, and it's also because ICAO never decides on the merits uh, when they act as a, as, a, as a court, quote unquote. It's not a court, but it's, uh, but they, they really brought, uh, I think, the issue further. Um, but of course, the pilots, uh, criminalization wise, they, 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 were, uh, they were prosecuted. So you, you know the story very well, unfortunately, because it happened in Brazil. Um, but this, I think, is where the ICAO has gained, uh, in French, we say you're gaining military uh, things on a, uh, you know, if you're military, you have these extra, um, extra medals, because you really, um, I think they, they're going to be able to do way more than they've done before. Uh, they will not decide on merits because they can't, but there will, be, uh, um, there will be consequences, certainly. And then, of course, we have the assembly next year um, of the ICAO. So without a lot uh, of work is done already, Brazil is, is obviously involved. Um, but I, I, do, I really want to wait for this, for this decision because also the facts will be put out there, the real facts, not the fantasy or, or, or whatever came out uh, of, of what happened. Um, so, yes, I, I, I really hope, I mean, there's a weakness, but I, I do hope that we'll be able to, to have the ICAO uh, more present, uh, even more present than it already is. You meant applets over rules, and you said applets over rules, that's the problem. <laughs> yes, that's the one, yes, yes. Of course, you're a pilot, you know. <laughs> I'm not lawyers, we don't, we don't wear them. <clears throat> Sorry. Thank you. Professor Farah, would you like to make some comments? And in respect of the others, I thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Professor Cartier, there is another question in chat from Mr. Ribeiro. And he would like to know about uh, the obligation, about what is news about the obligation to be vaccinated for uh, crews, uh, for uh, employees of airliners to be vaccinated, vaccinated, and what are the decisions about uh, decisions and regulation on the matter right now uh, on this subject? Uh, that's that's really really interesting. So thank you for that. Um, so the, the WHO, Wealth, uh, World Health I'm sorry, Organization, as well as the UN WHO, which is uh, the, um, sorry, UN WTO, which is the World Tourism Organization, not World Trade Organization. Um, they uh, um, joined also with ICAO on that particular, particular part. Uh, regarding certification, because it's connected to certification as well, the question is, do we bring this into certification as well? Do we say vaccination purposes? Um, as long as I've traveled to Brazil, I always have my, my uh, yellow uh, uh, little book uh, with, at the time, only yellow fever. Uh, interestingly, there was a whole debate in the Netherlands, because when we got our, our vaccination, uh, <clears throat> they basically told us, uh, oh, oh uh, we're not going to put the stamp into this uh, certificate because it's only about yellow fever. As we know, it's not true. The certificate has any vaccination you need. And if you go to India, for example, you need quite a few other vaccinations than just yellow fever. So um, this is also part, of course, it was an issue. It, it is an issue for the, for the traveling um, uh, uh, crew. Uh, I know that in Europe, um, uh, some, uh, it was in the States, I'm sorry, in the States, uh, some uh, uh, people were fired because they, they refused to be vaccinated. Uh, this didn't fall under federal law. It fell, uh, uh, it fell sorry, on uh, local municipal law. So it's not a federal level in the US. Um, so from that perspective, we don't have a precedent yet. Um, when it comes to IASA, I believe IASA will have a decision very soon uh, because again, it's to do with licensing. And so the licensing we have in the, uh, in the EU uh, can you be uh, <clears throat> can you be traveling? Uh, can you be sorry? Can you be uh, crew, cabin crew, or cockpit crew, and maintenance crew? Uh, it's it's uh, basically every human at the airport. Uh, those who are the um, I call it the um, reduced mobility passengers. You have this personnel. It's in it's uh, it's in Europe. You have it also in Brazil. But in Europe, it's part of a regulation. We have a specific regulation that airports. Uh, basically pay for that. And so you only have to say uh, two days before I need help when I land. Um, and so these personnel as well, there was the issue in the Netherlands, do we vaccinate them too? 
um, in benevolence, it went rather quickly as a discussion because people were massively in favor of, of vaccination. So uh, that didn't uh, play too much of a role, but um, uh, trade unions were very concerned because uh, some people in benevolence still don't want to be vaccinated. And uh, we, we assume that crew as well, but in this case so far, they've been grounded and that is out. Uh, so we don't know what would follow. Um, but I do not think uh, in most countries in the EU that you can be uh, forbidden uh, or you're firing anyone, uh, um, any personnel for not being vaccinated. Uh, but it's, that's why we are a bit cowardly waiting for the European Commission to take a decision um, on that because then it would be uh, obviously a regulation, not a directive. It would be a regulation because it deals with safety. Um, for me, I, I don't understand uh, why you would not be vaccinated. It's my, my personal uh, approach to things, but um, especially it's for free, it's organized really well. Um, but okay, it's, it's, it's something that will belong eventually to the licensing in the EU as for internationally uh, based. Uh, I don't know what the ICAO has in mind for that, I have to say. Um, but uh, the decisions so far have been American and municipal, not federal law. So we, we have to, to limit our, our knowledge to that for now. Um, but I, I, I don't know what Brazil plans, but I, I know it hasn't been decided as far as I know. I hope it helps a bit. <laughs> but I'd like to know more about the topic, for sure. Thank you very much, Professor Excel. Is there anyone else, uh, professors, eminent professors who are here present, coordinators? and students, lawyers, professionals from air sciences that would like to participate mm. and ask questions to Professor Excel. The floor is open. You can participate either vocally or through yes. chat. Don't be shy, I can't do anything to you. I'm too far away. <laughs> so I'm going to ask Professor, please. <laughs> Now it's my turn. <laughs> I'd like to, to ask you, Professor, if there is any kind and expectancy of reforms in EU regulation to 261 from 2004. Because there's yeah. been a lot of discussion of this regulation during uh, the crisis, as you'd write, as you'd uh, would rather uh, denominate it, nominated. But um, is there any any expectancy of reform of consumers oh, yes. considering yes. regulation 261? Uh, 261 is, I'm very happily saying that is the one that unfortunately I have to know about it, but I escaped so far to, to, to work with it. Um, to see, okay, so um, the, the, this is 2004, uh, the, re the regulation. So it's been already six years, we're talking about a new regulation. Um, with Brexit, because I don't want to blame everything on the English, but I, I do have to bait a bit. So with Brexit, um, the, the reaction of the parliament and of the council was to block everything. So everything was blocked at the council, whether passengers, ground handling, taxes, charges, uh, single European sky, name it. Uh, all the important files for aviation were blocked um, uh, up to, uh, well, basically today. Um, so some progress was done on, on slots with the, the, the crisis, but it's still not a new regulation. Regarding 261, so this regulation was also blocked there. In the meantime, we have a, a very active court. I was going to say uh, two active courts, uh, European courts, uh, so the Court of Justice of the European Union, so, so our court, which uh, has been, there's a, there's a case decided um, I think every every two weeks we have something coming out. It's it's unbelievable, um, and so uh, some cases came out. Uh, well, a couple of cases came out that are really, uh, I think, of, of relevance to 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 the current situation, which was essentially to do with the fact that airlines gave vouchers, and they said, oh, uh, you know, keep the vouchers and then uh, don't ask any money, and then you can fly with us any time after that. Uh, and of course, uh, the, actually the Netherlands even did that, which I was surprised, I have to be honest, they, they, because they were saving also financially KLM, so you have to be a bit logical. But they said, no, no, uh, passenger rights, uh, you're entitled to reimbursement. And so you were thinking, in other words, the government is actually paying for this because there was no income, so how else do you want to pay? So this was something interesting. So there was a decision on that, that airlines had to 
uh, payback if a passenger is so asked. And so you can imagine passengers asked a lot. Um, I had, because I travel normally every two weeks um, maximum, um, I had something like 25 vouchers um, <clears throat> at the time where the crisis started. And so uh, it's, it was surreal how many, uh, but I, I didn't ask any money back. Also, yes, I could afford it. So it was, it was not something that uh, everybody can I understand. Uh, but for me, it was, it was more the issue of saying, do you still want an airline at the end of the day or, or you don't? And you also have, um, it exists a regulation, I forgot the number, I'm sorry, but the regulation of the European Commission that basically tries to save airlines from bankruptcy. So explain to me how can you pay back vouchers plus on help state aid based on crisis um, and, and, and to, to basically give it back to, to passengers. It's, it's just two worlds that somehow don't meet. Um, but these decisions came out, uh, more are coming out now. Um, but if, if you want to write uh, uh, about uh, 261, you'll be one of the, uh, <laughs> let's say, very successful lawyers. I mean, I have uh, two friends uh, that they've been, been working 10 years. Their whole business model is based on 261. They have nothing else. Uh, they're doing really well. Um, so it's, it's just to say it's, it's a way of thinking. It's, it's for me, it's, I, I, no, it's, not, it's not my way. But um, the point is, I'm really curious to see the new regulation, but right now, all we know is that the regulation will, of course, take in what the courts have decided. I mean, you have a case law that will be integrated into the new regulation, but we don't know. Um, what is very interesting to see is what extraordinary circumstances will be. So extraordinary circumstances is where the carrier doesn't have to pay anything back. Okay, we know that um, uh, if there's anything out there, is always to tell us this is not an extraordinary circumstance. So there was a volcanic ashes, I think you remember that, from Iceland, with this impossible to pronounce uh, volcano. Um, and then we had this, um, I'm not gonna say be very nice, but this commissioner, but frankly, I, I wondered if she understood anything about aviation, but okay. And she said, oh, it's not an extraordinary circumstance. And you're thinking we have people sleeping at Skipo uh, there are no hotels anymore because you have all these uh, tens of thousands of people at Schiphol that can't go, uh, sorry, the airport of Amsterdam, that can't go anywhere. And they even made an appeal to people, say, please, can you come to the airport and have passengers at home until they can fly again? I mean, we really had this. <laughs> it's, it's really, well, of course, people did it, but the point is it, is, it was surreal. What is an extraordinary circumstance? So there is this document which is non-binding which has been produced by CAAs in Europe, which is what the courts was kind enough to say it is an extraordinary circumstance. And they have recognized that bird strike was an extraordinary circumstance, which is very nice of them because I don't know if you've ever been in an aircraft of a bird strike, I have, I don't wish it to anyone. Um, I'm sure you saw the landing on the River Hudson, nobody wants that. Uh, if that's not an extraordinary circumstance, frankly, so if because from the court perspective originally before there were several cases and then they were saying, oh, but uh, birds are in the sky and planes are in the sky. So sometimes they meet. That was essentially what the court was saying. Yes, birds fly, but uh, hello, uh, it's, it's when you have Canadian geese that are entering uh, uh, your engines, uh, I mean, you can't fly anymore. It's, it's what it means. You, you're really lucky if you have this great commander on board that saves you. But uh, if you don't, then well. Um, so this is what I'm looking forward to see if this list, first of all, will be integrated into the new regulation or if it will come up with a new one, uh, updated one. But um, I think right now we all say European Union, do things, do it, because we states, we, we, we really don't want to do it anymore. So do it, do it. But, um, but it's not a closed topic. This 261, it's going to go on. It's, it's the most regula known regulation of the whole of Europe, which is sad if you think about it. But okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. There is another question in chat from uh, Mr. Uh, Ibero. Also, he uh, would like to go back to the topic of COVID-19 and ask you if there is any data concerning embolism or vascular uh, side effects concerning the crew or employees who have been vaccinated? Okay, that's 
<clears throat> really, really interesting because uh, very good questions, good heavens. Um, <clears throat> if I go back to uh, DVT, so deep vein thrombosis, uh, this was extremely a uh, high topic in the 90s and uh, early 2000, not to say it's not important anymore, but a lot has been done to avoid a deep vein thrombosis that really can kill you. I mean, it's, it's not a, a small, uh, small affair. Um, and so health and traveling and air health or aviation health um, has been even more brought to the fore uh, with, with DVT. And I, I believe they will have the same approach with, uh, um, well, COVID. <laughs> I said it once and that's it. Um, because um, as, as it goes by now, with, I think, asthma and uh, heart diseases, uh, this is the most studied, the most analyzed um, a sickness in the world right now. So it's a virus we know, but um, it's there's so much money involved at the moment. Um, so much uh, is at stake that I, I really think that we will have uh, something such as um, a description of a uh, 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 possible, I say about the side effects of uh, of vaccines because. Uh, these exist. It's, it's not. It's not something that is only limited to to this uh, British Swedish uh, uh, vaccine, AstraZeneca, which we were very proud in Leiden because we have this biotech um, whole park, I mean uh, scientific park, obviously. And AstraZeneca is there and said, "Oh, we're going to produce vaccines." So we thought, as as people in Leiden, "Oh, we're going to have. Uh, you know, we can go anytime and get our vaccines. You know, we can have it every day." And then we thought, hmm, that's, uh, that's not, uh, hmm. Um, but I, I, my aunt had AstraZeneca, she, she's fine. She, she had no, no, no effects whatsoever. Um, so unfortunately it, it does happen, it has happened, uh, but I do think it will go beyond uh, this virus. It will go um, um, over other um, diseases that have vaccines already present, such as yellow fever. Um, and I, I do believe it will be eventually um, even more demanded to have vaccines uh, to, 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 to go to some countries. It, it won't be limited anymore to yellow fever, that is certain. So I don't know if a new certificate will be issued, I'm not sure, um, but I expect to have a, a, such an agreement because it, it, it cannot, we can't pretend this didn't happen. And we know something else will come, unfortunately. And again, I don't want to say that, but it's it's we had SARS before. Uh, SARS was limited, fair enough, but uh, this one we know wasn't. So um, the problem also, and I'm sorry to have to say it, but we dealing with a country where the virus started, but wasn't exactly very open in terms of information. Um, so um, we can accuse WHO for not having, we can do many things. But we need to have this, this dialogue open because whether it's the same country or another one in the future, uh, are we certain that it's, if it's a country, um, I don't want to say, let's say France, I mean, I don't want to, but um, let's say France, are we certain France is going to collaborate fully? Uh, are we certain that states want to share everything? Um, so we need to have a higher level of, um, of um, communication, of diplomacy, because uh, we need short term agreements, uh, because we all agree, we need to have this, uh, this, uh, this known and we need to have this registered. Uh, the only uh, ones we need to have on board, um, <clears throat> I think, are the companies, uh, the manufacturers of these vaccines, because they might be quite reluctant uh, to uh, communicate or at least to uh, not to communicate, but to agree that this is a risk to their vaccines, because then they might have <laughs> a production issue. Um, so this is a part where I think the lobby with vaccines, uh, vaccine manufacturers will be, um, is needed. And uh, yeah, it's, it, it, cannot, it cannot be postponed uh, to, to any time later. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, Professor Fada, please, the floor is yours. Mm -hmm. I wish you had more time to keep up discussing. Professor Axel, but my concern is how is uh, the ICAO and the European Committee seeing the uh, litigation in the Brazilian territory according to airlines? Airlines that flies to Brazil, they have a lot of claims, consumer claims, and I have myself point in the, some meetings with the very scholar professors that are very prone to protecting consumers, even 
one of those uh, writers or authors was my former professor in my master's degree. And I have argued, I mean, legally speaking in, in class, that uh, in the airline business, we, we can protect others and safety matters. So uh, it's not a normal consumer. So what I'm saying is in Brazil, we overprotect consumers and penalize airlines for this cost. And in the end, in the end everybody pays. There's no free lunch. I'm saying, uh, of course, we have to, do, to, to be respectful and to be safe. But some, for example, in Brazil, I think is the only country that an airline is liable to pay for meals if the airplane is, the airport is closed for due to meteorological conditions. Do you think it's correct? No. <laughs> uh, well, um, in the 261 regulation, there is um, the, the it's not the airline that has to feed people; it's the uh, the airport. Um, so, uh, I mean, you're getting a voucher from the airline uh, for 15 euros. I mean, don't expect a lot with 15 euros, that's all I can say. But uh, you, you have uh, what is, um, it's called uh, uh, duty of care. So duty of care uh, is limited to uh, a voucher of 15 euros. Um, some will have access to the business lounge, they're a bit luckier, of course. Um, but uh, I remember because I, I'm one of these people who have access to, to well, a bit more because I fly uh, more. Um, and I remembered just telling the, the airline in Brazil said, I'm okay, I'm good, I'm good to the lounge, I'm fine. You know, it's, it's, it's there's everything there, I'm fine. No, 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 no. And they gave me all these things. I didn't ask any of it. And I was just, look, it's the first time in my life that I'm saying no to things that look very, very nice, but you're thinking, why would I need all this? It's, it's ridiculous. My husband enjoyed greatly because uh, you know, he's, he's really tall and he had all these people looking after if he was comfortable, if the seat was nice enough. And it, it, I mean, it, it, was, it, was, it was very funny. I mean, for me, it was very funny, but I was thinking um, um, airline personnel, they're not waiters, you know, they're not, and waiter is a, is a garçon, as you say in Brazil. It's a beautiful job, and I find it one of the most beautiful jobs in the world because you, you know people, you, you bring them food, you make them happy. I think it's a fantastic job. But on board an aircraft, yes, they bring you coffee and food, but they are safety people. They're trained for safety. Um, and so uh, it's also a question of respect uh, towards, uh, towards, well, authority, but towards people who train to also maybe save your life. So. Um, this idea of saying that I have every right and I'm going to get it now and I get even more than what, I, what I'm expecting, I find it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's extreme. I, I do believe uh, uh, there is a chance that this is going to change a little bit uh, when I see how much ANAC has done with uh, consumers as uh, involving them in their discussion groups and task, task forces. Uh, so that I find uh, um, quite promising. I don't think it will be a result tomorrow, um, but I do, I mean, at least the, the issue is known. So it's also about educating people um, um, to, to not, uh, well, as you said, there are no free lunches, which is the first uh, class actually I had back in McGill with my professor, unfortunately, who passed away, Professor Milder, who was originally from uh, Czechoslovakia. So he, he was a political refugee in Canada originally. So he came for a conference and stayed in Canada, applied for, for asylum. Um, and he was a director of a legal bureau eventually uh, and the director of the institute and, and a remarkable professor. Uh, but he said, you know, there are no free lunches. I mean, what do you expect? It's, it's, you need to, to pay for something. Um, if I can compare with, with space in terms of telecom, all of us have these wonderful phones, but well, ruin our lives most of the day because we spend too much time on it, okay? But we have this access to uh, GPS signals. Uh, GPS is a service for free. I mean, we don't pay the service. We, we pay other things, but we don't pay that service that is provided by the US. Um, that's why we tried in Europe to launch Galileo and I was, I was working in there and it was a bit frustrating because it's only this week that the two last satellites have been launched. Imagine 20 years after. But okay, they are there, we'll see if it works. The point I'm making is that GPS is a US property. And so we all use it for, for free in terms of we don't pay. Is it, I, I don't find it a, a smart idea to be honest. I'd rather pay for something because at least it makes me independent. Um, and then if it doesn't work, I don't have, I, I can't do any complaints. 
So when you're a consumer in Brazil, when you say, I paid, yeah, but you didn't pay for all this. You didn't. You, you paid to go from A to B in a safe fashion. And then the only obligation of the airline is to give you water. That's the only one. It's not food, it's water. Because without water as human beings, we can't spend one day. But that's all. That's really all. An aircraft in Europe cannot take off if it doesn't have water on board, water to drinkable water. That's a, that's a non-written law, right? But it's not about getting all this, all this, all this madness. I mean, I, I was next to this lady that was filling in a form and she was declaring that my luggage was lost and I had Louis Vuitton and I don't know what. And I was thinking, seriously? And, and, and she was perfectly happy with that. And of course, she got the maximum amount, which was, I think, something like 5,000 euros uh, for me. And I think I was thinking 5,000 euros, it's, it's business class to Australia. Are you insane? Um, so it's, it's just this, um, I do think it's really involving the consumers um, as stakeholders that will change a, a lot of opinions. Um, and maybe the new generation, and I don't say we, uh, we don't matter anymore, but I say those who are now 20, 25, that went through this corona crisis, that uh, were students that bravely for 18 months uh, didn't see any professor, didn't see any student, um, didn't see anybody. Um, and, and I think these ones are, are more likely to bring us forward uh, to really uh, uh, have a healthier connection to, to, uh, to consumer law. Um, and it's also, I think, connected because we took too long in having consumer laws. So by the time we had the laws, some behaviors were already there. Um, and so this is something that, um, honestly, if I look at some cases of 261, I, I'm, I would never think about it myself. I would, I would never, ever think about it. So why would you even spend time and money? And it's ridiculous. Um, so I'm, I'm having difficulties with that. I don't expect uh, a change tomorrow. Um, but regarding Brazil, I really think that involving the consumers uh, in the discussion to really for them to see uh, what it means financially when you do this kind of, of things, that might change something. So it, it all depends if you, if you have a, a consumer associations that are uh, very active in terms of not class actions, but in terms of communicating to other consumers of what laws really are. So that I think it's, it might be, um, if it's the case, and I hope it's, it is, it is I, I think it might bring a difference. Uh, but of course, well, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, if it's a culture, then yes, it takes, takes time to change. You need a management of change, basically. That's, that's, uh, but it can't go on like this, that is, that is certain. Thank you very much, Professor. Any comments, Professor Farah? Thank you very much, Professor. Before we finish, I'd like one more question, please, if, you, if I may, about uh, passengers' name records, because you talked about uh, cybersecurity and passengers' name records and their references are a great topic right now under municipal law, let's say like that, because they, we all have pr uh, data protection uh, acts. And uh, what is the news about uh, passengers' name records in terms of uh, air law, international air law. Yes, uh, I will start with Europe, if you don't mind, just for one particular reason, uh, because we have this, we have a parliament, so that's wonderful. But uh, we, when PNR came into being, our parliament, I wouldn't, I was not going to say was not well educated, because it's not true, but they were. I could have say that they seem to be less aware of the consequences of their decisions. And, and I really mean it in a way of, of you know, a lot of nations, uh, our European parliaments, I don't know if you've been to, to any of them because it's in three different locations in, in Europe, but it's, it's uh, I mean, it's immense. Uh, there are uh, 21 languages, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's crazy. Um, and it works to some extent, but uh, what really did uh, bother me was, and this is already a while ago, um, this was after 9-11. And so, of course, 9-11, we, we said yes to everything because, of course. But there was a moment I really had issues with that, and I'm still having issues right now about it. Because what the US did was, okay, from now on, you have to register on its website, uh, what's the name already, to, to, to enter the country before as a French citizen, which, by the way, I have to say, having a French passport, um, this is one of the pass passports that has the most success to the most countries without prior visa. 
So we can go to, to I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a luxury. It's really absolutely luxury. Um, so going to the States, you would land, you would pay $6, and then that was it. So it was on spot. Now you have to go on this ESTA uh, uh, thing, which, by the way, Canada also has it because the U.S. has it. So Canada has to have it as well. Um, a part of Canada is with Brazil, the only country I ever landed where people say, welcome. And in Canada, they say, welcome, bienvenue. Of course, it's in both languages. And it's fantastic. It's, it's, uh, it's the only, uh, I never saw that in France with anybody. So, but okay, so you arrive in, in uh, uh, um, you, you arrive in the States and then, but now you have this ESTA. So the ESTA thing, uh, um, it's a lot of information in there. And you're thinking, I mean, seriously, uh, and when you're looking at what the airlines are asking of you, so what kind of meal do you have? So in other words, if you're eating a certain meal, then it means that you're Muslim uh, or you're Jewish. So it's already something that it is an important information that belongs to you normally, not to the whole world. Um, but okay, so a lot of information and, and how many times you've been and why and all that. Um, and then I looked at the law for this and then I was horrified because we gave them authorization to keep this data for 50 years, five zero, 50 years. So we have, yeah, 35 years to go of 40 years. How, who gave authorization? This parliament gave for 50 years. Can you imagine that? Um, so for me, I was, I was beyond shocked. Whereas from the US side, five years. And you're thinking, yes, that's equal. That's, that makes sense. So this is something that really, really uh, bothered me. By the way, right now, US citizens can come to Europe if they're vaccinated. We can't, just saying. But OK, um, th this is also things like that that I find, uh, I find problematic. But um, PNR was really because in the heat of 9-11, and yes, we understand, and yes, we support it. But Europe knew terrorism as well. So we had also quite a lot of set of laws and understanding of privacy uh, as well, which that didn't come across, that didn't come across at all. So uh, regarding PNR uh, right now, um, uh, before 2020, <laughs> um, there was uh, a lot of meetings that were planned at the FAA, uh, at the DOT, uh, so Department of Transport and, and uh, Federal Aviation Administration in the US. Uh, they were all postponed for obvious reasons. Uh, we hope with the new administration uh, there will be um, there will be an opening, um, but I do hope. Uh, yeah, I really hope that this is this is going to to come up. But from a European side, now we have this famous um, RGDP. Uh, so uh, this is a regulation that is on data uh, privacy. Um, uh, Europe has a duty. They have to do something. They have to to protect us further. And by the way this regulation and everything we have in Europe protecting private data is for whoever is in Europe. It's not based on your nationality. So if you're an American citizen, Brazilian citizen, whoever, coming to uh, Europe even for two days, you protect under the same laws. So this is the very minimum that you expect from the other side of the Atlantic. I'm sorry to limit it to the US. But so internationally, so far, we don't have an agreement because mainly uh, of the fact that a lot of meetings with the uh, with the US were were basically postponed, so this is something also to to expect. Um, I think I think it's all going to come in one go. I mean, we're going to have a lot of information, um, and and this is this is one of them because privacy is obviously yes at the heart of it, and also because the US is heavily behind all the financing uh, of the the EV tolls and and uh, um, super drones and Uberization and all that. So that they really really. Uh, uh, aware of that, uh, and I think it's also a lot of consumers this time that are actually bringing good things uh, in the US as well, that are bringing forward their wish to be protected uh, as well in terms of their, uh, their um, um, well, their privacy. Uh, amazingly enough, it came from one particular case, which was this uh, Boston Marathon, um, these two brothers who, who killed people on a, on a marathon in, uh, in Boston, and um, they, at some point, uh, the FBI wanted information that was on the cell phones. And this is where people said, no, no, no. <laughs> and then the FBI said, but hang on, this is, this is a, a terrorist. You know, one died and, and, and one was, was wounded. But I mean, they kill people, so we need the information. And then people said, no, excuse me, if you do it, 
then you could take any excuse and you'll, you'll do it for us as well. So it was interesting that it came from this case, uh, but you, it's a very strong movement in the US. So I really expect something within a year, uh, in any time, um, in time for the um, um, assembly of the ICAO. So somewhere in, in October, uh, before, before October next year, we'll have normally something uh, in, in the area. Thank you, Professor. I was quite overwhelmed to see that uh, some, some airliners are performing matchmaking with PNR. And I, I was quite overwhelmed to, to find it, find that out. But I mean, it's, it's quite... Uh, there, was, there was a moment, and this is not a joke, and this was a time that KLM had a horrible CEO. And I'm sorry if it's international, I don't care. It was a horrible CEO. Uh, he never really understood what aviation was about, didn't know the files. I mean, let, let's not don't even talk, waste time on him. But okay, he had this fantastic idea that we could actually, before we flew, say, hey, next to whom am I going to sit? And so he started to have this Facebook page out of all places in the world, Facebook. I mean, sorry, security-wise, not exactly the best. And then to say, hey, I'm flying uh, tomorrow, da -da -da, so I want to be next to an interesting person. So how about you tell me who is going to be next to me so I can prepare a conversation or something? And I thought that this is really, I thought it was a hoax. I thought it was a joke, but no, it came in, into my, of course, I'm part of Sky Team. So I get these emails. I said, but he's insane. It's, it's just so he doesn't talk to his legal department or something. It's, it's unbelievable. That didn't work, surprisingly, because people said, yeah, I don't really care. Thank you very much. And also don't say to people my name. I mean, it's, are, you, are, you, are you mad? Um, so I, these are things like this that, that can be surprising, but luckily, we have intelligent people everywhere, and the more are trained in air law, the more we're likely to take over the world. So I think it's great. Thank you, Professor. It was an amazing, spectacular lecture. We are very, very glad and honored to have you here in Brazil in Belo Horizonte at Sejin, at our legal and uh, business center. Thank you very much. I hope you could participate in the continuous activities we are going to have during the, this post-graduation, during this first, the opening of this first class. Thank you very much for the professors here present. And thank you very much also for the coordinators here present. Uh, Professor Sergio Moran and Professor Alessandro Lander. We are very, very happy to have you and we are surely having you again uh, in the near future during the, the course of this post-graduation. Thank you a lot to the professionals, lawyers, uh, uh, professionals from air sciences all here present and audience also on YouTube. I'm very, very glad to be hosting uh, your lecture, Professor. Thank you very much. Have a a rest of the night, a great rest of the night for you. <laughs> just to show you, because if you want, I can I can give you a presentation. It's just for you to see. I have this bibliography in case you're interested. Um, that would be great. That would be great. They are very, 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 very lucrative. Uh, propaganda. And propaganda. Thank you. Always good. So that's uh, that's that. Done. Thank you very much. So. I'm closing now the, uh, the, our opening lecture, our opening class of the post-graduation from 2021 of Air Law in Brazil at Sejin. Thank you very much. We're very honored and to see you soon, Professor. Very gladly. Thank you very Merci much. Merci beaucoup, au revoir. Merci beaucoup. À tout à l'heure. Merci beaucoup. Bonne nuit. <laughs> bonne nuit à, bonne nuit à tous. <laughs> Thank Merci. you. Bonne nuit. Bonne nuit tout le monde. <laughs> <Voilà>. <laughs>